himself for an opening statement. Today, we continue the Select Committee's work at looking into the government's efforts with big tech to censor speech. First, it was Twitter. When Elon Musk took over the company, he called it a crime scene and released information through Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberger, two journalists who we've had in front of this committee a couple times, showing that the government was deeply involved in the content moderation decisions at Twitter. Then it was Facebook, where folks from the White House, Andy Slavitt, Rob Flaherty, were telling the company to take down posts that they disagreed with. The White House pressured Facebook to censor true information and even told them to take down a meme. Then it was YouTube. Biden White House said, why aren't you guys at YouTube taking down more, quote, borderline content, which is content, speech that doesn't violate YouTube's policies, just content and speech that they didn't like, didn't agree with their narrative. Both Facebook and YouTube caved to the White House pressure because they knew they had to keep good relationships with the White House for important policy decisions. We call that coercion. Then we learned how they all teamed up, big government, big tech, big academia, working together to censor Americans in the lead up to the 2020 election through the Election Integrity Partnership and the Virality Project. This partnership created at the request of the federal government sent thousands of links directly to big tech to be censored. True information was targeted. Jokes weren't safe either. Even members of this committee were targeted. Congressman Massey, we've discussed that throughout this Congress in several different hearings. And it wasn't just conservatives. It was mostly conservatives, but it wasn't just conservatives. And yesterday we shared what we've uncovered about the White House pressuring Amazon. Internal Amazon emails are unbelievable. It says, if the, is the, think about this one. Is the administration asking us, we put this out in a Twitter thread yesterday, is the administration asking us, Amazon, asking us to remove books, or are they more concerned about search results or both? Stop and think about it. Government pressuring Amazon to ban books. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, all this big combination impact election, and now we find the same thing was ha happening, the same dynamic was happening at Amazon. Today's hearing, how the government is trying to take censorship to the next level by weaponizing artificial intelligence tools to limit speech in real time and at scale. In the name of combating alleged misinformation regarding COVID-19 in the 2020 election, the National Science Foundation has been issuing multi-million dollar grants to universities and nonprofit research teams to develop artificial intelligence powered censorship and propaganda tools. These tools can be used by government and big tech to shape public opinion by restricting certain viewpoints and promoting others. In notes from the University of Michigan's first presentation to the National Science Foundation about its NSF funded AI powered called WiseDex tool, they said this quote. So this is when the University of Michigan is making their pitch to the government to get taxpayer money they said, our misinformation service helps policymakers at platforms who want to push responsibility for difficult judgment to someone outside the company by externalizing the difficult responsibility of censorship. Think about that last phrase, by externalizing the difficult responsibility of censorship. They said right up front what they want to do. They want taxpayer money coming to them so they can develop tools with AI to censor American speech. I don't know if it gets much scarier than that. Non-public documents obtained by the Select Committee reveal the disinformation researchers referring to their work as, quote, censorship in the slides they presented to the National Science Foundation. The National Science Foundation tracked reporting critical of its program, including an article written by Mr. Uh, Professor Jonathan Turley and by Ms. Richardson, one of our witnesses today. And they developed a specific media strategy they considered blacklisting, and they considered blacklisting conservative media. In one project proposal, document to the National Science Foundation, the researchers explained the need for a, quote, proactive suite of human technologies to assist rural and indigenous communities, military veterans, older adults, and military families, all of whom the researchers claimed were unusually susceptible to misinformation campaigns online. I want you to digest that for a second. If you're an older American, you served in our military, and you live out and fly over country, you're too stupid to know what's true. 
And these guys wanted their tax money, our tax money, the very people they described, they took their tax money to develop tools to censor the people that they took the tax money from. Another project proposal sent to the National Science Foundation demeans Americans who hold, quote, the Bible and the Constitution as sacred and choose to review primary sources rather than rely on expert consensus. You think the Bible's sacred, you support the Constitution, and you review primary sources to think for yourself, you're the problem, according to the National Science Foundation, and they're going to give your tax dollars to entities developing software, developing this technology, this tool, to censor your speech. One other proposal document said this, reactive content moderation is too slow and ineffective. And that's what this hearing's about. AI, which can censor in real time and at scale, should scare us all. The pattern we've seen emerging is deeply troubling, but for the work of this committee, we'd have never known about all the censorship going on. And now we're concerned, obviously, about how artificial intelligence can interact, can use these tools uh, develop these tools to censor and restrict American speech. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. And with that, I would yield to the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to our witnesses for all being here, um, being a part of the discussion, expressing your ideas and the work that you have been uh, engaged in. But I do have to say that we sit here today in another iteration of the same hearing we've had over and over again in the 118th Congress. The sixth hearing of the same topic, a merry-go-round of Republican greatest rejections of conspiracy theories. We are here to attempt to once again discuss the same issue in a different way. Not once has my colleague, the chairman, requested any ideas from my side as to what we might agree on discussing as the weaponization of the federal government. I would say the IRS propensity to audit working class people, and especially people of color, rather than wealthy individuals, can show some weaponization of the federal government. Or a book banning and censorship in schools and school districts receiving federal funding. As with many hearings, my Republican colleagues don't really want us to work together. Chairman Jordan has allowed his staff to provide the bare minimum notice for hearings without a subject or identifiable topic, without publicly announcing who the witnesses are, without even the decency to tell the minority anything. I know that we've come to think that that's normal, but that's not how Congress has always worked. This is, in fact, the sixth, sixth time in this select subcommittee that a hearing of ours has had the exact same name, Hearing on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. That's a broad, broad topic and could mean anything. For the minority to prepare to engage with the majority with such a topic, just as further demonstration how far we are from actually doing work. This is about platform. This is about speaking to Fox News. This is not about solving problems for the American people. We've come so far from what Congress has been, even in the short time that I've been here, which I can't believe is almost a decade now. It's shameful. So, I'll use my side in our discussion to talk about what we think is the weaponization of the federal government, what we believe to be the real threat to our democracy and the rule of law, the attempted weaponization of the federal government during the Trump administration, or even more frightening, the extreme weaponization of the federal government that the former president has told us he will do if he is reelected. Just since the, our last hearing, the fifth hearing, former President Trump has made more terrifying statements on the weaponization of the federal government should he have a second term. Donald Trump has said he will, quote, act like a dictator on day one of any second term. 
he has said he would proudly claim full credit for overturning Roe v. Wade, a woman's protection from overbearing state and her right to privacy. He's argued in court as a legal argument that he would have full immunity as president even if he ordered the assassination of individual Americans. He says he's going to lay off thousands of non-political career diplomats, replacing experienced government experts that serve with distinction with individuals whose main quality is passing a loyalty test to him. He has vowed to appoint a special prosecutor just to go after Joe Biden, his entire family, threatening them multiple times because he doesn't like them and he, they are a threat to him, not to our country. Trump and his followers are obsessed with charging Biden or any Biden individual for a set of wildly changing charges with a real set of projection in that to things that he himself and his own family have done for charges that our congressional Republicans still cannot seem to produce documents or their own witnesses to corroborate. Now, one of the other statements that I gave to you a little earlier to remove non-political career diplomats with individuals who are willing to take a loyalty pledge is also very troubling. It should be obvious to anyone that replacing these qualified people en masse with expressly political operatives of any stripe would undermine Americans' interests and is the hallmark of a fascist state. And finally, the idea, the sick audacious notion that a president could order the assassination of an American citizen at will without a single legal consequence runs aground of every American sense of right and wrong. That is what Donald Trump argues he can do. Not in public speeches alone that could just be campaign promises or rhetoric, but in a federal court filing where his attorneys must be put the argument requested and discussed with their client, Donald Trump. Donald Trump believes as president that he can deploy, let's think about this, the American military on American soil to attack an American target, an individual, which in this hypothetical example has not declared any form of hostility towards the American state itself, but is merely who the president believes is not his friend or agrees with him. This idea is, and you know, this is my own legal parlance, the craziest illegal, dictatorial, despotic, demagoguery, autocratic crap I've ever heard. Today, the chair is going to have us go through another round of claims about the weaponization that are his witnesses' beliefs about social media on the part of the federal government. The chair and my Republican colleagues on this subcommittee will ignore or try to make light of or even mock the unmistakable promises Donald Trump has made to weaponize the government on his own behalf. Where are the hearings about a former president who believes he can use the federal government to kill his political opponents? Where is the hearing about a president who believes that the most important quality of his appointments to run the greatest and most important country in the world is that they are loyal solely to him? Where is the hearing to discuss, never mind Trump, but even the idea Let's not just make it about Trump. Let's have a hearing about the idea of a president using the resources of the federal government, the appointment of a special prosecutor to go after those he deemed to be the enemy, not of this country, not of this ideals, but of national security, but of himself. And if you don't think I am thinking this, if you don't think that this is my thought and important to me, Let's take it from the word of people who work directly with the man. John Bolton, former national security advisor to Donald Trump. I think Trump will cause significant damage in a second term, damage that in some cases will be irreparable. John Kelly, his former chief of staff, said in a second term, it's just simply would be chaotic. 
because he continually be trying to exceed his authority, but the sycophants would go along with it. It would be a nonstop gunfight with the Congress and the courts. Bill Barr, President Trump's former attorney general, I think for people going into that second term of Trump administration, I think they have to be ready to oppose the abuse of government power. That's the weaponization of the federal government. But I don't think that's ever going to be a topic that the majority is going to bring for us. So we, the majority, will have to bring it for you. And with that, I yield back. Without objection, all of the opening statements will be included in the record. We will now introduce today's uh, witnesses, Mr. Greg Lukanoff. I think I got it right, Mr. Lukanoff. Uh, is the president and CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights and Express Fire. He is an attorney, a New York Times bestselling author, and an expert on the First Amendment. We welcome you to our committee today. Uh, Mr. Lee Fong is uh, an independent journalist and one of the authors of the Twitter Files. Uh, he began his career as an investigative blogger for Think Progress and has worked for The Intercept, Vice, The Nation, Republic Report. Mr. Fong received the Izzy Award in 2018 from Park Center for Independent Media uh, for his work at The Intercept. We're glad you're with us today, Mr. Fong. Ms. Caitlin Richardson is uh, a contributor at the Daily Caller News Foundation where she primarily covers legal issues and the federal court system. In 2023, she reported on National Science Foundation grants that are being used to develop censorship technology, the focus of our hearing today. And as a result, frankly, of her work, the National Science Foundation adopted a strategy to avoid any media scrutiny, and, and so we appreciate uh, your good work there. The Honorable Norm Eisen is a senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. He previously served as U.S. Ambassador to the Czech Republic from 2011 to 2014. And I had the experience of working uh, not with or for, but maybe against Mr. Eisen when he was with the Democrats in the 2019 impeachment effort. We welcome you as well, Mr. Eisen. Um, uh, we welcome all our witnesses and we thank you for being here. We'll begin by swearing you in. Would you please rise, raise your right hand. Um, do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief so help you God? The records show that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Please be seated. Please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you try to summarize it in five minutes, but we'll be, we'll be, we'll be fine with that. Uh, I think we're going to start with Ms. Richardson, and then we'll work right down the line, if that's okay. Uh, so, Ms. Richardson, you're, you're recognized for five minutes. Just make sure your mic's on and go, go right ahead. I want to thank the committee for inviting me to testify today. My name is Caitlin Richardson. I'm a reporter at the Daily Caller News Foundation, a nonprofit news outlet based in Washington, D.C., dedicated to holding public officials accountable and exposing government waste, fraud, and abuse through in-depth investigative reporting. I cover the Supreme Court and do investigative reporting. In September 2021, I started looking into the government's funding of censorship tools after finding that the National Science Foundation had launched a program awarding grants to researchers to develop projects aimed at combating misinformation. What I discovered was a multi-million dollar effort to build what I call a censorship industrial complex, using taxpayer dollars as seed funding for various projects. The efforts fit within the broader trend of the federal government's increasing involvement in online censorship, from the Center for Disease Control flagging posts during COVID-19, to the FBI working with social media companies to suppress the Hunter Biden laptop story. In September 2021, the National Science Foundation awarded $750,000 each to 12 teams of researchers as part of a new research track within its Convergence Accelerator program titled Trust and Authenticity in Communication Systems. Proposals range from fact-checking tools that warn journalists when publishing content may result in outcomes like polarizing discourse or perpetuating false narratives. Six projects which are currently ongoing advanced in 2022 to the second stage and received an additional $5 million in funding. One, a digital dashboard called Course Correct aims to help journalists locate and correct misinformation. Run by researchers in the University of Wisconsin system, the project uses machine learning to identify networks where misinformation is spreading and pinpoint who is sharing it on social media. It highlights issues like vaccine hesitancy and electoral skepticism as areas of special interest. Another AI-based grant project by the company Medan aims to curb racially targeted misinformation by developing algorithms that scan millions of posts and map them to misinformation narratives. 
The Convergence Accelerator Program is not the only way the NSF has steered taxpayer dollars towards the development of censorship tools. The NSF awarded the University of Washington $550,000 to develop language technologies that detect and intervene in hate speech and discriminatory language, like sexist, racist, homophobic microaggressions. It awarded the University of Houston $50,000 to develop an online dashboard with misinformation forecast trends. It also approved $324,000 in 2022 for a summer camp at Old Dominion University to teach students about the rapidly growing research area of disinformation detection and analytics, which is scheduled to happen again this summer. The goal is to prepare students for future disinformation-related jobs, an indicator this is a growing industry, and as the sampling of grants demonstrates, one the federal government has a multi-million dollar stake in. Even as a lawsuit challenging the federal government's communications with social media companies to censor speech progresses to the Supreme Court, these grants and the tools they are developing have received comparatively little attention. The NSF swears it does not engage in censorship and that it does not partner directly with social media platforms. But taxpayer dollars spent on projects that do are still troubling, as were the agency's responses to straightforward questions about its programs. When I reported on Convergence Accelerator grants shortly after their announcement, the NSF devised an official media strategy instructing research teams to highlight pro-democracy nature of their projects. I only know this thanks to emails unveiled in a report this committee put out today. Again, when I wrote for the Daily Caller News Foundation in early 2023 about projects that advanced to stage two, Emails from the committee report show they privately considered removing videos about the projects they were funding from YouTube. If the agency's reaction to fair questions from journalists is to strategize ways to rebrand and avoid attention, why does it have any business funding tools that tell reporters what is true and what is false? If their impulse is to hide information, how can projects it backs be trusted to sort out what information is authoritative? The government is not the arbiter of truth. Our founders understood this, which is why we have a First Amendment. They understood the danger of the government telling people what they should believe and targeting opinions that cut against the official narrative. Pursuing information control by funding outside organizations is no less a threat to free speech and freedom of the press than a tyrannical government. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. Ms. Fong, or Mr. Fong, excuse me, Mr. Fong, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Plaskett, esteemed members of the Select Committee, my name is Lee Fong. I'm here in my role as an independent investigative journalist. I see it as my duty to serve the broad public interest and spotlight wrongdoing, whether it comes from the left, the right, or the center. I appreciate the opportunity to share my work here today. I've long covered issues concerning free speech and censorship. Artificial intelligence introduces a new dimension, offering the unprecedented ability to monitor, to flag, and to censor billions of individuals at a scale and scope never before conceivable. Some of you may be familiar with my October 2022 investigation delving into the history of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, or CISA, and the FBI's concurrent expansion into policing social media. Using court documents and evidence provided by a DHS whistleblower, I reported that government programs initially designed to curb foreign influence and incitement to terrorism had transformed into a broader campaign to suppress ordinary domestic speech. CISA's expansive focus eventually touched on a wide range of political topics, from the 2020 presidential election to the origins of COVID-19 to criticism of the Ukraine-Russia war. Two months later, in December 2022, I reported on a cache of Twitter's internal corporate documents that became known as the Twitter files. I gained access to internal emails, tools, and chats that confirmed my earlier reporting on CISA. I've since published many articles based on these documents, on my substack, leafong.com, including a piece released yesterday. In my latest report, I reveal that CISA acted on an inaccurate tip regarding a New York Times journalist's observations about delays in the presidential vote count in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Instead of ver verifying the ver veracity of this tip, CISA directly lobbied Twitter to restrict access to the reporter's tweet. In response, Twitter shadow banned the Times reporter's tweet, effectively rendering it invisible to most users. I understand the stated intent behind these efforts, the desire to uphold the highest standards in our elections and to deter any illicit manipulation. However, as this and many other cases illustrate, the government often errs and frequently acts in a politically motivated manner. 
For this reason alone, it is inappropriate for law enforcement or intelligence agencies to act as the arbiter of permissible journalism. Moreover, government censorship of truthful and accurate speech, rather than dispelling conspiracy theories, only serves to exacerbate the erosion of public trust in our elections. My Twitter files and broader reporting differs slightly from recent testimony heard by this committee. I've also shed light on the role of private sector entities in attempting to control and curtail public discourse on areas of major public policy. I revealed that a group called Public Good Projects regularly collaborated with Twitter to censor social media. This censorship campaign was entirely funded by biopharma lobbyists that represent Moderna and Pfizer. In some instances, the demands for censorship targeted accounts simply for expressing opposition to vaccine passports, a debate that should be open in a free society, not repressed by a drug company with financial interests at stake. More recently, in collaboration with Unheard and Real Clear Investigations, and with my co-author, Jack Paulson, I reported that Moderna relaunched these efforts to influ influence vaccine discourse last summer, again working with public good projects. Moderna employed the services of the artificial intelligence firm TalkWalker to monitor vaccine-related conversations across 150 million websites, including social media and gaming platforms like Steam. There are many other examples in my reporting, beyond the Twitter files and Moderna documents, that show overreach by government and corporate interests to stifle free speech. Last month, I revealed documents on the activities of Logically, a British artificial intelligence firm that is poised to shape the 2024 election. It is important to underscore why the American public should be aware of this firm. Logically previously had contracts in the United Kingdom to combat misinformation during the pandemic, but like many other firms of this nature, they instead surveilled legitimate forms of speech, including thoughtful concerns about pandemic lockdowns. Logically boasted of a special partnership with Facebook, to automatically suppress and label any content they deemed as misinformation, giving the company immense influence over content moderation decisions. In my official written remarks, my testimony, I go into much greater detail about my record on these issues, writing on censorship and surveillance of animal rights activists and labor union activists. I have profiled the various private contractors that began by spying on behalf of the FBI during the war on terror that now utilize artificial intelligence to spy on conservative anti-vaccine mandate activists. More recently, I've reported on organized suppression of peaceful speech by pro-Palestinian activists. I present these varied examples to underscore how censorship affects dissenting voices of all ideological stripes. I understand that in our intensely polarized environment, free speech has become a divisive issue, often misused by politicians seeking a convenient scapegoat. History teaches us that government and private entities demand censorship authority to attack dissidents of a particular group in one era, those tools are then used against an entirely different set of actors a few years later. Today's cheerleaders for an unaccountable content moderation regime may well be tomorrow's victims of that same system. In the interest of time, I want to keep my remarks brief and close by drawing your attention to a hearing held nearly 12 years ago by another House committee addressing a remarkably similar topic. At that time, lawmakers demanded answers about of revelations that the Department of Homeland Security had engaged a private contractor for round-the-clock surveillance of social media. During that hearing, Representative Jackie Speer, a Democrat from California, expressed her alarm at the potential for a Big Brother effect and called for assurances that DHS was not infringing upon, quote, civil rights and civil liberties of those who choose to use social media or, quote, spying on lawful activities. Representative Pat Meehan, a Republican from Pennsylvania, cautioned against DHS for monitoring private citizen speech. He said, could, quote, have a chilling effect on individual privacy and people's freedom of speech and dissent against their government. In many ways, that hearing may appear quaint in today's context. In terms of bureaucratic and technological abilities, it was a relic from another era. This was before CISA existed. This was before we had much more powerful and intrusive AI. This was before the cottage industry of censorship groups operating under the banner of anti-misinformation. Nonetheless, the 2012 hearing serves as a reminder that these issues need not be divisive on partisan lines. I implore the committee to rise, against, rise above partisanship and perceive the threat posed by online surveillance as an American issue that affects all of us. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fong. Mr. Lukanoff. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Plaskett, and distinguished members of the Select Subcommittee, good morning. My name is Greg Lukianoff, and I'm the CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, also known as FIRE, where I've worked for 23 years 
Fire is a nonpartisan nonprofit that uses litigation, scholarship, and public outreach to defend and promote the value of free speech for all Americans. We proudly defend free speech regardless of a speaker's viewpoint or identity, and we have represented people across the political spectrum. I'm here to address the risk uh, AI and AI regulation pose to freedom of speech and the creation of knowledge. We have good reason to be concerned. FIRE regularly fights government attempts to stifle speech on the internet. FIRE is in federal court challenging a New York law that forces websites to address online speech that somewhere, someone somewhere finds, quote, humiliating or vilifying. We're challenging a new Utah law that requires age verification on all social media users. We've raised concerns about the federal government funding development of AI tools to target speech, including microaggressions. And later this week, FIRE will fi file an amicus brief with the Supreme Court explaining the danger of jawboning, the use of government pressure to force social media platforms to censor protected speech. But the most chilling threat that the government poses in, in the context of emerging AI is regulatory overreach that limits its potential as a tool for contributing to human knowledge. A regulatory panic could result in a small number of Americans deciding for everybody else what speech, ideas, and even questions are permitted in the name of, quote, safety or alignment. I've dedicated my life to defending freedom of speech because it's an essential human right. However, free speech is more than that. It's nothing less than essential to our ability to understand the world. A giant step for human progress was the realization that despite what our senses tell us, knowledge is hard to attain. It's a never-ending, arduous, necessarily decentralized process of testing and retesting, of chipping away at falsity to edge a bit closer to truth. It's not just about the proverbial marketplace of ideas. It's about allowing information independent of idea or argument to flow freely so that we can hope to know the world as it really is. This means seeing value in expression even when it appears to be wrong-headed or even useless. This process has been aided by new technologies that have made communication easier, from the printing press to the telegraph and radio to phones and the internet. Each one has accelerated the development of new knowledge by making it easier to share information. But AI offers even greater liberating potential empowered by First Amendment principles, including freedom to code, academic freedom, and freedom of inquiry. We are on the threshold of a revolution in the creation and discovery of knowledge. AI's potential is humbling, indeed frightening, but as the history of the printing press shows, attempts to put the genie back in the bottle will fail. Despite the profound disruption the printing press caused in Europe in the short term, the long-term contribution to art, science, and again, knowledge was without equal. Yes, we may have some fears about the proliferation of AI, but what those of us who care about the civil liberties fear more is a government monopoly on advanced AI, or more likely, regulatory capture and a government-empowered oligopoly that privileges a handful of existing players. The end result of pushing too hard on AI regulation will be the concentration of AI influence in an even smaller number of hands. Far from reining in government misuse of AI to censor, we will have created the framework not only to censor, but also to dominate and distort the production of knowledge itself. But why not just let OpenAI or a handful of existing AI engines dominate the space, you may ask? Trust in expertise and in higher education, another important de developer of knowledge, has plummeted in recent years due largely to self-inflicted wounds borne by the ideological biases shared by much of the expert class. That same bias is often found baked into existing AI, and without competing AI models, we may create a massive body of purported official facts that we can't actually trust. We've seen on campus that attempts to regulate hate speech have led to absurd results, like punishing people for simply reading about controversial topics like racism. AI programs uh, flag or refuse to answer questions about prohibited topics. And of course, the potential end result of America tying the hands of the greatest programmers in the world would be to lose our advantage to our most determined foreign adversaries. But with decentralized development and use of AI, we have a better chance of defeating our staunchest rivals or even Skynet or Big Brother. And it's what gives us our best chance for understanding the world without being blinded by our current orthodoxies, superstitions, or darkest fears. Thank you for the invitation to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Ambassador, you're, welcome, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Plaskett, and members of this subcommittee. 
Weaponization of government is an intensely personal topic for me because my family was a victim of the worst weaponization of modern times, the Shoah, the Holocaust. My mother survived Auschwitz, a slave labor camp at Neuengamme, and a death train in the last days of the war. My father was trapped in Warsaw in 1939, miraculously made his way out to the United States and then joined the U.S. Army to fight that weaponization of government by the Nazis and their Axis allies. Most of the rest of their families did not survive that weaponization. My maternal grandparents were murdered by it, quite literally, in the gas chambers at Auschwitz. There and across Europe, dozens of members of my family were murdered by genuine weaponization. So I agree there can be no more important topic than the weaponization of government. I urge the committee, with all respect, to focus on the most imminent threat of that weaponization now facing us as a nation. Donald Trump's record of weaponizing the government and his promises to double down should he return to power. Given my family history, I would be remiss if I did not speak up before you today about the ominous historical echoes of statements like this. That we will root out the communists, Marxists, fascists, and the radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country that lie and steal and cheat on elections and will do anything possible. They'll do anything, whether legally or illegally, to destroy America and to destroy the American dream. The threat from outside forces is far less sinister, dangerous, and grave than the threat from within. Vermin. The former president has raised the prospect that his chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff should be executed for his efforts to mitigate U.S.-China tensions. He's promised that if he wins the presidency, media outlets that featured negative coverage of him will be thoroughly scrutinized. And he's issued a blanket threat to his opponents. If you go after me, I'm coming after you. The former president has even admitted he will be a dictator if he returns to the presidency, he says it will only be on day one. But history, alas, teaches us that dictatorial powers, once assumed, are rarely relinquished. What Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who Trump admires, has done in Hungary is probably the right comparison to what might happen here in a second term, not the most chilling examples from earlier in the 20th century. Why? because America was founded on the principle of preventing the weaponization of government against the American people. That is central to our constitutions and its protections, including the First Amendment. And whatever we may disagree about today, I know that everyone in this room does agree on the central importance of the protection that the First Amendment provides. But we do no favors to the First Amendment when we cry wolf, when none is at the door. It is no violation of the First Amendment for government officials to inform social media companies of posts that put the American people or our democracy in harm's way. For that reason, in Missouri v. Biden, the Supreme Court was correct to stay the injunction of such contacts while it considers the question of their constitutionality with respect to government engaging with AI companies, it is consistent with the First Amendment for the government to make its views about safety or other concerns known to AI providers, or to utilize AI as it does a vast array of other technologies, or to support scientific or scholarly research on AI. AI can be used wisely or wrongly, lawfully or not, like any other technology, the same technology that was used to deliver my mother and her family to Auschwitz also enabled my father 
to escape from Warsaw and to report for duty in the U.S. Army. Trains are not inherently suspicious, neither is AI. I look forward to discussing all of this today, including my scholarship on AI and democracy, which I have submitted for the record. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Ambassador. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from, we will now proceed to five minute questioning. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky for five minutes. When my constituents complain about their taxes, I tell them to be thankful you don't get all the government you pay for. Unfortunately, with AI, it looks like you're gonna get more government than you paid for because of the scale uh, that's at which we're able to deploy this bureaucracy of uh, censorship. You know, a former congressman lamented that there were, with the dwindling number of farmers and the growing size of the USDA, that there would eventually be one farmer per bureaucrat. In fact, he said he was walking through the USDA down the street and saw somebody crying in his cubicle and said, now, what, why are you crying? He said, my farmer died. Now, it used to be the case that if you were going to be subjected to government, that it had to be a person who had to do it to you and that at least there could be a fair fight. But what disturbs me the most here is that, I mean, this is at scale. You could have one bureaucrat who is censoring millions of people at once. Uh, Mr. Lukanoff, did you, did you see the White House executive order on artificial intelligence, the, the statement that was put out? Uh, I found that to be chilling because basically they're trying to ban AI but I like to say, if AI is banned, only the criminals will have AI. And the criminals, in fact, will be inside of the government. Can, we, can you tell us about that executive order or statement? Oh, microphone, please. There were aspects of the executive order that I, I thought were good, but overall, um, I, I am concerned about it opening the door to, it takes for granted, for example, that hate speech should be something that's regulated. And I've been working on campuses now for, my organization has been working on campuses for 25 years, I've been there for 23 of them. And I think you'd be shocked to discover how tame, moderate speech actually will get labeled under as hate speech. So I think that all of the lessons we've learned from higher education and about how uh, vague and broad terms can actually end up stifling uh, ordinary, ordinary speech and opinion should be something we learn in the context of AI, but we seem very hesitant to actually learn those lessons. The thing that troubled me is they're literally trying to ban math mm -hmm. and, and powerful computers, but they are the ones who want to have them. Speaking of uh, hate speech, unfortunately, this project was funded at my alma mater, MIT, where they decided they needed a proactive suite of human technologies because that reactive content moderation wasn't quick enough. Uh, I mean, that's Orwellian. Basically, you're trying to predict. F to them, to these researchers, the most efficient content moderation would be your keyboard refusing to allow you to type it in, mm -hmm. would it not, Mr. Fong? Oh, that's right. I mean, uh, one of the firms I just discussed logically has discussed uh, a proposal to automatically counter hate speech or misinformation with AI to kind of engage bots to algorithmically argue on the internet on behalf of the government or whoever else employs them. And you know, that just opens the door to all types of mis abuse. And the, and the people they propose to argue with, they say, um, who, are, who need to be re-educated are military veterans, older adults, minorities, rural and ind indigenous communities. Is that correct? Well, look, um, there's a, a broad scope here, you know, and we don't know, even know all the clients for some of these firms. So when they've got these partnerships with TikTok or Facebook to counter misinformation, sometimes they're working for the government, and other times they're working for corporations on brand reputation. So, you know, who's holding the fact checkers accountable? Can, um, Ms. Richardson, um, when you reported um, on this Track F funding of, of censorship, what happened? Did they... I mean, I think this is ironic that they turned and tried to control the narrative against them. I suppose if they think they're doing something righteous by controlling the debate, then it would be righteous for them to try to defend themselves and um, with the tools that they have. You want to speak about that? Oh, microphone, please. Yes, so based off of the emails that this committee obtained, after I sent a couple 
very basic questions, um, reaching out about what exactly these grants were, what exactly these programs entail. It seems that they created a media strategy um, in order to deflect questions and cast this, what some of the messaging said, they would call it as pro-democracy. Um, so it, it is ironic, and I wonder if they see that irony. I mean, <laughs> I certainly see the irony. It's deafening that they're, they're going to turn these tools on you. They're going to try to shut down, to protect free speech, in their definition of it, uh, you know, a loud speech, they're going to shut down your speech. I find it quite ridiculous. Well, you know, I think at the end of the day, what we're going to have to do is quit funding this. I mean, Track F is the name of a grant program that we funded, and it's probably been going on for a long time. So thank you for bringing our attention to this. I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know what? One has the sense that all of this exercise is about projection. And the definition of projection is when an individual or individuals unconsciously or consciously project their thoughts, feelings, or behaviors onto someone else. When we talk about weaponization, like Ambassador Eisen said, we are concerned. But my friends on the other side of the aisle want to persuade the public that the weaponization to worry about is the one that doesn't exist. And hopefully you will not pay attention to the real threat Ambassador Eisen and others have in fact described. There's a monstrous effort going on as we speak to structure a second term for Donald J. Trump. And those proposals inter alia include replacing up to 50,000 federal employees with Trump loyalists, bypassing the civil service protection, and essentially gutting the Pendleton Act of 1883. Invocation of the Insurrection Act on day one to quash public protests against him. A suppression of speech three of the four witnesses today apparently aren't concerned about. And quoting former President Trump himself here, quote, the termination of all rules, regulations, and articles, even those found in the Constitution, unquote. Ambassador Eisen, let's go through a speed round if we can. You, if you can, tell me who said this. The American people deserve to know that President Trump has asked me to put him over my oath to the Constitution. Anyone who puts himself over the Constitution should never be President of the United States. Who said that? Vice President Mike Pence. And his party? Uh, his party is the Republican Party. Thank you. Here's another one. Very good. I think he's unfit for office. He puts himself before country. His actions are all about him and not about the country. Who said that? Okay. Hold on. Hold on, Mr. Connolly. Hurry uh, up. Chairman uh, Trump's uh, defense secretary, Excellent. Mr. Esper. You are good. You are good. <laughs> Republican appointee, former Trump secretary of defense. All right, this one. A person that has nothing but contempt for our democratic institutions, our Constitution, and the rule of law. There's nothing more that can be said. God help us. Who said that? That, that one is the former chief of staff, Kelly. You are. Mr. Kelly. And also a Republican appointee Trump, uh, to the Republican Trump, president. A Republican appointee. That's I don't right. know if he himself is a Republican. He long-term uh, uh, military person. Excellent. So far, you're batting 100. If he were elected to a second term, this time he might do damage that would be irreparable. This is a very dangerous period we're about to enter into here. That one I know, he and I have had some differences over the years. We tried to get him to come testify in the impeachment and uh, we were unsuccessful. Uh, that's uh, Bolton, Ambassador Bolton. Bolton, my fellow ambassador. So why do you think, Ambassador, given all of those... Was it correct? Yes, I'm sorry, 100%. 100%, <laughs> you get, you get perfect score, score. Very good. Um, but why do you think the majority here in this committee and in other committees want to kind of ignore those warnings from prominent Republicans, not squishy, 
Republicans, not even sort of pseudo-Democrats, about what could happen in a second term in terms of weaponization. Uh, Mr. Connolly, I had the honor of working with those on both sides of the dais. Um, we haven't always agreed on the issues. Uh, privately, we have had conversations where we ad agree and disagree. Um, I, 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 it would be my preference if, in addition to, to the important questions that we've heard today, and I have my points of agreement and disagreement with the others who the majority has invited. Mr. Lukianoff and I were talking before the hearing about uh, uh, our shared orientation on regulation of AI. Um, I would prefer, I won't guess or impugn motives, uh, but I would prefer and I would urge publicly or privately if we could work together at least on the Insurrection Act. Well, if I can interrupt you, we won't question motives, but we certainly will question the agenda. And that's why I began with the definition of the word projection. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for five minutes. <laughs> oh, excuse me. The gentleman from Kentucky has a UC request. Mr. Chairman, have a UC request. I ask unanimous consent to submit for the record. October 30th, 2023, executive order from Joe Biden uh, titled Executive Order on the Safe, Secure, and Trustworthy Development and Use of Artificial Intelligence, where he says AI reflects the principles of the people who build it and then tries to reserve it for the government. Without objection. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida. So, Mr. Richardson, as I understand the National Science Foundation, they take government money and then they dole it out in the form of grants to colleges and universities that then build censorship tools that big tech then relies on so that big tech has an arm's length away from the censorship that's shaping viewpoint. Is that essentially what your reporting concludes? Essentially, this track F program, which was through the Convergence Accelerator program, awarded these $750,000 grants to 12 initial projects. And then six of these continued on to have an additional $5 million in funding. Uh, most of these are at universities. Some of them are private companies as well developing these tools, but they are all, all within. Yeah, and we're gonna, and Mr. Eisen, I guess my question to you, if, I, if, if you're done texting, um, would be like, is that okay with you, what NSF has done? Put your microphone, please. As a veteran of committee staff, I should uh, know better. Uh, Mr. Gates, I have not had the opportunity to uh, study the report. In okay, okay, well, let me go through some of the grant requests then. So the okay, MIT... Might I finish my sentence, well, please, me, Mr. I, Gates? I, I've got, I, I, I've got if I can time. just finish so, the well, sentence. Well, uh, no, you were finishing your text earlier. I'm going to finish the question. So Mr. MIT, Gates, just for the MIT record, I was asking for the law communities that and governs that. Rural the communities are Florida, you'll get susceptible. Yeah. I'd ask my time to be restored. Yep. Mr. Eisen, Mr. Eisen, the question is... The MIT grant that said that people in rural communities were particularly susceptible to misinformation. Do you have an opinion on that? I do have an opinion, Mr. Gates. As you know, there are two texts that are holy to me because Mr. Gates and I have talked before. One is our Torah, our Bible that I live by. Uh, I'm an uh, uh, observant person. That is a holy text to me, and I have the deepest respect. And I have traveled to those places. I guess Mr. the problem. I guess the problem, Mr. Uh, can is I that can I please well, finish my answers? The other text that is holy to me is the Constitution. In my quick review of this report, those are my two holy texts, and I share that with the chairman and others on this. I know that. Uh, in my quick review of the report, it appeared to me that a great deal of the evidence uh, related to legitimate sponsorship of scientific and technological research. Okay, well, let me stop you there, Mr. Eisen, because here's the problem. While you indicate that the Torah and the Constitution are your sacred texts, if Americans indicate online that the Bible and the Constitution are sacred to them, the very grants that are being issued by the NSF would deem those people in a separate and diminished class where no, they would sir. be, oh, it, it indeed, it, it is precisely in 
the so MIT. I have the materials here. No, sir. I, I would request that the committee release the testimony of Kate Starboard, the University of Washington scientist, the former WNBA player. But that wasn't this grant. Player. That you're, you're talking about a different grant, Mr. Eisen. She yeah. MIT explained. Said, she MIT explained. said that if you're rural, if you're part of a military family, if you view the Bible and the Constitution as sacred, then you're going to be, and you know why they said you're uniquely susceptible to misinformation? Because if you think the Bible and the Constitution are sacred, you might not rely on the expert class, yep. Yep. right? You might not rely on all the folks in D.C. and at all the think tanks, and that's really what people have to rely on. And so when, when we're taking government money to go and try to to harm people who have a particular religious view or a particular view on the Constitution, I, w I would think that in that type of a circumstance, we aren't crying wolf when there's none at the door. Mr. Gates, if we can talk about that material in context, if we can have the full context of the committee's investigation, the ranking member has said there are 29 depositions that this okay, committee but Mr. has Eisen, taken. Okay, but Mr. this isn't about any of those. This is about the, when MIT wanted the grant that Ms. Richardson was just talking about, right? They went and made a presentation to NSF and they said, here's why you ought to pick MIT in order to do it. And it was to target military families, people in rural communities, people who believed in the Bible and the Constitution. And then guess what? With these AI tools, if you stack that up, Maybe you're a person in a rural community who loves both the Bible and the Constitution. Well, then you're really susceptible to misinformation because the expert class thinks better. No, um, sir. That, I, have you seen you the movie? The full have you seen the movie Minority the Report? Record. Have you seen the movie Minority Report? Tom Cruise. Yes, I have seen that. Doesn't film. this kind of feel like that? Yeah. That you're trying to do that? That, that yeah. it's coming to life before our very may eyes? I, may because I you've got the government funding these predictive analytics to go after Americans. And here's what I think is actually true. It's not that military families and rural Americans and people who love the Bible and Constitution are dumber or uniquely susceptible to anything. It's just they don't think like how the expert class and the National Science Foundation wants them to think. And so they're trying to program what they see so they can control what they behave. And that is the true weaponization this committee will stand against. I yield back. Well done. Well done. The um, gentleman yields back to the gentlelady from Florida. Thank with you. Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I think it's been well established through several, uh, nearly all of these committee hearings that this, this subcommittee was built on a bogus foundation that the federal government was weaponized to take down and silence conservatives. Seven hearings later, we have yet to see any real evidence of that, including this one. Meanwhile, our MAGA loyalist colleagues shamelessly ignore Donald Trump's ample record and mounting threats to turn our executive branch into his personal vendetta buzzsaw. We could easily look at his past abuses, say, to hurt the owner of the Washington Post or his vast attempts to overturn a free and fair election, one that he soundly lost. Better yet, we could look at his unfolding 2024 enemies list, where prime targets are sure to be doctors who provide abortion services and half of our population in America, America's women. Ambassador Eisen, it's good to see you. Thank you for being here. Donald Trump brags about how he, quote, was able to kill Roe v. Wade, as you can see here. What would a second Trump presidency mean for American women who need life-saving abortion care? Congresswoman, uh, nice to see you also. Thank you for inviting me. Um, the meaning of a second Trump term, as in so many other issues across the board, would be devastating, potentially devastating, for women and for all those who are affected when women require life-saving abortion care. The decision of the United States Supreme Court in the Dobbs case uh, represents a betrayal of the principle of stare decisis, the principle of settled law, to impose uh, an agenda uh, that is dangerous and threatening. Th thank you, thank you. Um, as you're leading to, Donald Trump led the charge to overturn 50 years of established law, decimating women's basic health care rights in the process. And it's no surprise, really. This is a man who bragged about grabbing women's genitals and stands accused of sexual misconduct by dozens of them, was actually li held liable for sexual assault. Uh, 
Trump's lack of respect for women is well documented, but as the MAGA leader, his animus emboldens extremists at every level to target women's reproductive health care. Interstate travel, social media messages, even the federal process used to approve medicine has been weaponized to target women. Texas has gone so far as to deputize the public as a weapon to restrict women's access to reproductive care. Ambassador Eisen, in your opinion, do you expect Trump to push for a national abortion ban outlawing abortion in all 50 states briefly if he were to win a second term? Um, Congresswoman, uh, as you know, uh, one of uh, Donald Trump's proudest accomplishments was that he was able to kill Roe v. Wade. Looking at his supporters and the fervent uh, sentiment for a 50-state abortion ban, and with the door that has been opened by the Dobbs decision, the removal of those federal protections for women, but for all of those affected, the families, the communities, um, uh, I fear that Donald Trump would seek to break new ground. If you don't mind, I want to drill down Please. a little bit. Can you detail how you think Trump could weaponize the Department of Justice or even the FDA to further restrict women's right to access abortion health care? Uh, he could order the Department of Justice uh, to appear across the country uh, to defend the increasingly draconian laws that are being put on the books to prosecute uh, those who are involved, even when it jeopardizes the life of the mother. Um, at the FDA, he could take additional restrictions, depending on how the Mifepristone case uh, comes out, take additional restrictions on medication and on health technologies. Thank you. Jeopardizing Thank you. women's lives. The White House should never be turned into a workshop to grind personal and political grievances. Trump did that during his last term and promises to do it again. Mr. Chairman, I always thought this subcommittee was a MAGA sham, but after what we've heard today, this subcommittee may need to be retained if Donald Trump wins the 2024 election and redirected towards actual weaponization of the federal government. Make no mistake, Trump will ramp up his efforts to weaponize the federal government against women. President Biden, on the other hand, continues to stand with women across the country and protects them against further erosion of our basic health care rights. So maybe we'll see you back in the subcommittee again next Congress, Mr. Chairman. I hope not, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Dakota, uh, Mr. Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, we talked a little bit earlier about making sure that it's arm's length, but it's not always arm's length. $5.75 million in taxpayer funds to a software company that proactively told the National Science Foundation it intended to leverage relationships with social media companies to identify and limit susceptibility to misinformation. $5 million in taxpayer funds to identify, test, and correct world, real world in instances of dangerous misinformation. $750,000 in taxpayer funds to MIT researchers studying whether certain groups are more vulnerable to misinformation campaigns. These re researchers believe that conservatives, minorities, and veterans were uniquely incapable of assessing the veracity of content online. The MIT project proposal stated that the need for a proactive suite of human technologies because broad swaths of the public cannot effectively sort truth from fiction online. The aura of superiority, elitism, and absolute arrogance should be shocking, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, it's entirely predictable. The federal government suppressing the, uh, the, the speech of its citizens by coordinating with researchers and pressing social media firms. The delusionary attempt to define and control misinformation and disinformation. Terms that this committee learned encompass true information, which is where we heard the dystopian phrase malinformation. The Biden administration would have you believe that even though information is true, it can be suppressed because it lacks context or what or was inconvenient to a preferred narrative. True information can be suppressed or simply wasteful spending of taxpayer dollars. Artificial intelligence has the potential to supercharge the government's censorship and suppression of speech. We know that AI will have the computing power to sort and analyze data on a massive scale, which has been the main obstacle to content moder moderation on large platforms. Less often discussed is, that, is the speed at which AI will process data and automatically censor speech. 
even to the point where censorship will be completely automated. Certain topics will be barred from being posted as opposed to being taken down. Ms. Richardson, your testimony describes how the National Science Foundation approved $324,000 for a course to teach college students about disinformation detection and analytics. This course was to prepare students for disinformation jobs. Can you further describe this disinformation course, the dangers it holds for free speech and the federal government's funding? Yes, yeah, so this course was a summer camp hosted for students to prepare them for jobs in the disinformation industry, which as these grants that the National Science Foundation is funding show is a growing industry and preparing students to work in it is just another way that the government is continuing to expand it. Restrictions on this type of speech require that the government have a compelling interest and restrict the speech in the least restrictive means. Funding these disinformation projects are clearly an attempt by the administration to indirectly censor censors of dis disfavored topics, which will avoid legal challenge and strict scrutiny re review. Do you believe that the indirect funding of such censorship is any less harmful to First Amendment and the right to free speech? I think that indirectly funding censorship tools is equally as harmful, especially as you described, many of these tools are targeting specific topics. Some of them talk about uh, vaccine hesitancy, electoral skepticism that's in their grant description as the kinds of speech that they're targeting. So I think it, it's quite concerning. Mr. Lukanoff, I've got a minute left and I appreciate the work FIRE does. And we talk, obviously there's been a lot talked about universities and these different issues, but I had the opportunity to work with your organization when I was in the North Dakota State Senate because one of the reasons I think this is so dangerous on the front end and turbocharging the ability to do this, particularly on college campuses, is the lack of due process that exists for students and how, how students actually have the ability to uh, appeal, whether it's a conviction, whether it's a censorship, whether it's everything, and how that can directly impact the rest of their lives. What is your number one concern with AI as it relates to college campuses and censorship? As it relates, uh, my number one concern with AI, um, and, I, and I do wish um, uh, that, that this could be taken more seriously by people on my political side of the fence, both Lee and I are more left-leaning, um, is, uh, is the inherent bias that we're already baking into it. That's one of the things that scares me the most. And just to give a comical example, we asked uh, ChatGPT to write a poem about why Representative Jim Jordan is the best politician in the country. It refused to do that. Um, we, we ran this for every single member of the committee um, and it refused to do this only for Republicans. It refused to do it for uh, Dan Bishop, sorry, uh, uh, Congressman. Um, and it only would write a generic one for Matt Goetz or Harriet Hagerman. Now this is a comical example of how, how this bias of my side of the political fence is actually being baked into the technology that's going to be the operating system for how we make any number of decisions going forward. And it never ever goes away. It never goes away. Thank you, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, yields back. Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. Yeah, um, I have a unanimous consent request. Uh, I've got a bill that I'm going to introduce that would prohibit the funding for disinformation research grants, secure and trustworthy cyberspace grants, and prohibit funding at the NSF for Track F. And I'd like to, uh, with unanimous consent, introduce that for the record. Thank you. Without objection. 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 Can we read that? Yeah. Can we just take a peek at that before <laughs> we enter into the record? I just, so it's one page long. I'll give it to you. Okay. All right. Without objection. Take the, that'd uh, be great. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Massey. I appreciate that. Yeah. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I, I, I'd rather be working on some other issues that are that are really urgent. Uh, you know, we've got we're in the midst of two global conflicts. We've got a land war in Europe, uh, and uh, Ukraine is running out of resources uh, to, to to fight for its own freedom. We've got a situation in Gaza that deserves our full attention. We've got a situation on the Mexican border uh, that, uh, you know, has humanitarian aspects to it, but also national security uh, uh, implications as well. And uh, this week, the U.S. Senate is scheduled to vote on a bipartisan national security agreement that seeks to address all those, all those priorities. Uh, though, it, though it is not perfect, there's an agreement that was carefully negotiated by a group of Republicans and Democrat and, and one independent uh, senator over the past several months. So I'd really like to be voting on 
those bills. I really, I really think that's it's, uh, it's Congress's responsibility to uh, to address those concerns. Gaza, Ukraine, and the U.S. border, uh, Mexico border. And I would welcome the opportunity to, to vote on those and support those bills because I think those really have an immediate impact and urgency that, uh, that this hearing does not. You know, it's, it's ironic that last week in the U.S. Senate, uh, my Republican colleagues uh, argued that there should be greater restrictions on, on uh, social media platforms and uh, greater restrictions. And here we, we keep going on about uh, not, an, well, uh, too, much, too much restrictions are already in place and the, there should be greater freedom. Um, Ambassador Eisen, uh, so we did hear recently uh, in, in uh, I think it was D.C. Circuit Court, where uh, President Trump's team argued that he should have immunity in a case where he ordered the U.S. military to assassinate his political opponent. Uh, they actually a they argued that case in, in open court. It was stunning, but um, when we are here sitting and talking about the weaponization, the weaponization of the federal government, does, does that scenario in which the sitting United States president orders in that case, they said SEAL Team 6, but the U.S. military, to execute his, his political opponent. They said he has, that, he has that right and he would Im be immune from prosecution unless he were first impeached. Uh, could you speak to that in, in terms of the weaponization aspect that we're supposed to be concerned about on, on this committee? Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Just this morning, as we were gaveling the hearing in, the D.C. Circuit, in a bipartisan and unanimous opinion, including um, uh, Judge Henderson, a Bush appointee, rejected the absurd notion of government weaponization represented by the idea, and I know my friends on both sides of the dais reject this, the absurd idea that an American president could order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political opponent and be immunized from the rule of law. It's another thing that we all agree on here today, like the importance of the First Amendment. The D.C. Circuit held, and thank goodness as a former ambassador, thank goodness for our standing around the world, because that's the kind of thing that those dictators that the president, former president, has voiced admiration for, Xi, uh, Putin, that's the kind of thing they do, the North Korean dictator, not American presidents. And the unanimous opinion said that no, of course a president cannot do that. That will put back on track, I believe, will put back on track uh, an important rule of law, perhaps the most important rule of law in democracy case uh, that our nation has ever seen and that's for the attempted weaponization, the genuine attempted weaponization of the United States government, including the Department of Justice and of state governments by the former president after he lost the 2020 election to retain power. Think of that. That's not America. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in closing, I just want to offer a, a, a unanimous consent uh, to enter into the record the decision of, of United States Court of Appeals today from this morning uh, in the case of United States of America versus Donald J. Trump uh, that was before the United States District Court of District of Columbia. Without objection. Mr. Chair, I'd like to introduce into the record, um, I know one of the witnesses said he had difficulty um, putting something together for you. Um, I'm so glad that the staff was able to actually using chat GPT just to have a poem written about you. Um, I look forward to reading it. In the halls of Congress, may I, if I could just read, where no, no, debates no, 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 ignite. No, 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 I just no, love. You can enter into the record, but. Uh, uh, it even talks one, about the heartlands of Ohio. The Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I appreciate it. I'm sure there'll be many poems coming from the Democrats about me in the near future. It's, uh, it's, it's very uplifting. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Well, I would expect nothing less. Thank you. Uh, I, I, neither I. The chair now recognizes himself. Uh, Mr. Fong, what happened in the last decade? 
I mean, in your testimony, you said, you said, uh, you drew our attention to a hearing 12 years ago, the Department of Homeland Security, there was a hearing on the Department of Homeland Security had retained a defense contractor to conduct round-the-clock monitoring of social media. And you said there was bipartisan opposition to that. What's, ha what's happened in the last decade that we do not, because here's the, here's the difference. Here's the big difference. The same agency, the Department of Homeland Security, last year tried to set up a disinformation governance board some committee which is going to tell us what we're allowed to say, what we're not allowed to say, and the only side objecting to that was the Republicans. And so I'm like you, I want to know what's happened in the last 12 years. I mean, a lot has changed. It wasn't that long ago that the Democratic Party stood up very strongly against the Department of Homeland Security and criticized it as a politicized agency. And by the way, Mr. Funk, you're, you're not a Republican, is that right? No, I'm an independent. Okay, keep going. But not that long ago, Democrats directly and forcefully criticized the Department of Homeland Security as an agency that run amok, that could interfere in our elections to help Republicans. This is an agency that's grown by billions of dollars since 9-11, that was originally set up to fight Islamic radicalization to prevent another terrorist attack, that now polices tweets, that now polices comments on Facebook and Instagram, that now, in a biased way, censors regular American legitimate speech on political issues. The ranking member said in her opening statement that there's no evidence of censorship. Is that accurate statement? Is there, is there any evidence? Is there no evidence of censorship, Mr. Fong? I mean, I just, on my Substack yesterday, showed a New York Times reporter, based on false information, being censored, being shadow banned. Yeah, but I mean, you, you covered in the Twitter files. Government pressured Twitter to take down certain tweets by American citizens. Facebook got pressure from the White House to do the same. YouTube got pressure from the White House to do the same. They all work together in this project, this election integrity partnership, to do the same. On and on it goes. But they say, oh, we've had six hearings on censorship. I kind of think, Mr. Lukanoff, I kind of think the First Amendment's probably worth doing six hearings. <laughs> I would say 60 hearings maybe better, maybe 600. I mean, we're talking about the First Amendment. Yeah. Would you agree? Well, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz hit the nail on the head that I just kind of wish we could think about this from a transpartisan point of view. They will immediately get this when it's a, a Republican administration trying to do the same thing. But we've presented a great deal of evidence that this is actually happening, that it's being encouraged by the government in many cases. The story that came out this morning, the idea of, uh, say, Donald Trump decides to actually try to get a book removed from Amazon. Um, if it was a book that uh, people on my side of the political fence, on the left, liked, we'd freak out, and rightfully so. Um, but, but at the same time, it seems like there's nothing we can actually do to get uh, you know, our own side of the political fence concerned about the, the idea of collusion between some of the most powerful people in Silicon Valley and in the country. The, cen and the, the censorship executive. mob will come for them too, right? Right now it's focused on, I mean, the Fifth Circuit said this, the court decision, it's focused primarily on conservatives, primarily on people on the political right. But it will come for the left too. Oh yeah, it already does. It already does. I, I defend and people it already on the left has. on campus all the time, um, and it's it's very strange to try to get people to be concerned when even people they uh, get, uh, agree with are losing their jobs. My, my latest book, Canceling the American Mind, is filled with examples just from the past couple of years of professors on the left losing their job. Oh, this is the reason I've invited more Democrats in here. Democrats like you guys, or independents like you guys, who actually embrace the First Amendment. This is what this is what we spent the entire. As they, they, they rightly point out, we spent the entire first year of this Congress. Prior primarily in this subcommittee, focused on what's happening to the First Amendment. Because I say this all the time. If you can't speak, if you can't talk, you can't practice your faith, you can't share your faith, you can't petition your government, you don't have a free press. I mean, that is, that is the, the, the ability to speak is fundamental to how we do things in this great country. And if we lose that, oh my goodness. And you said something earlier that, that stuck with me. You said, we're losing even the ability to ask questions. Mm -hmm. It's not just statements. You can't even question. You could go back to COVID. You couldn't even say, I wonder if this thing came from a lab. If you just raised the question, you got censored. Oh, and down the line, it went. we learned just a week ago, a couple weeks ago, that Dr. Fauci, when he was asked, where did the six foot uh, social distancing come from? And you know what he said? We just sort of made it up. I'm not sure where it came from. And think of the impact that had. But if you questioned that, if you just asked the question, why do we have a... The, the, it, I mean, the, half the time, the stuff they tell us is just false. You can't even question that, for goodness sake. So that's why it's important we have these hearings. And folks like you who aren't on the same side of the political aisle as us are willing to come forward. We appreciate it. I'll give you a chance to respond in the last 10 seconds. 
the um, uh, when I was talking about literally, I'm talking about literally questioning as well. Like one of the things that we did with ChatGPT was run the questions that we ask students about whether or not someone should be allowed to speak on a particular campus, and we were told one of the questions by ChatGPT was an in, uh, inappropriate question to ask ChatGPT. Yeah, and and again, highlighting the danger of when this goes to scale and happens in real time with artificial intelligence. That is the frightening part. That's why we got to get this right. It, gotta... it treats us like children, not citizens. Well said. Well said. Uh, with that, I uh, recognize the gentleman from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for setting up my question. You're quite correct. The government does have awesome power if it tends to use it in an inappropriate way. We've already heard today the direct quotes of the former president and wannabe president, uh, Mr. Trump, that he would use the government to suppress speech which presumably is what you were arguing for, free speech. You said very clearly that he would do so. Uh, in fact, uh, he's uh, reportedly planning to use the Insurrection Act, a law that gives the president nearly unchecked power to use military as a domestic police force to target those who publicly protest against him, presumably using their free speech rights in the Constitution. Much of this seems to be coming from an organization uh, here in Washington, a think tank, that's put together a program called Project 25, uh, 2025, which essentially would use executive orders that would deploy the military domestically using the Insurrection Act. Ambassador Eisen, a while ago, you wanted to talk about the Insurrection Act and how it might be used by the former and wannabe president once again. Could you speak to that and the trouble that the Insurrection Act could bring to free speech here in America? Thanks, Mr. Garamendi. Um, the um, Insurrection Act, um, as uh, members on both sides of the aisle know, was enacted in 17, 1792 and grants the president the authority to deploy the U.S. military domestically and use it against Americans under certain conditions. It, it, it's the primary exception to the Posse Comitatus Act under which f federal military forces are generally banned from participating because of the danger, because it betrays that a core American idea that we won't use our military against our own people on our own soil. Unfortunately, the uh, Insurrection Act uh, does not contain definitions of key terms like insurrection, rebellion, domestic violence. Put aside the imminent danger of a president formerly in the White House, who's seeking to return to the White House, who has made the kind of alarming statements. Irrespective of party, it should be an absolute imperative to modernize and update and limit the utilization of this dangerous statutory tool, but it's particularly urgent given the threats that the former president has made. And, and when you put those threats in context of what people who say these things have done around the world, and indeed who have said these kinds of things, uh, they mean them. So I think it is important, urgent. If there's one thing, if I could ask my friends on the other side of the aisle, if there's just one thing we could do that we could agree on Americans, and it goes fundamentally to conservative principles about limiting go government and the danger of government and the power of executive overreach, please update, limit, confine, constrain, the Insurrection Act, bring it back into accord with fundamental American principles. Thanks, Mr. Garamendi. Uh, much to be said about this entire subject of free speech, uh, the use of AI. Uh, it seems to me that if I were a um, mm, consumer product company and someone were to put forward disinformation on the internet about my product, would I want to be able to 
have a information from MIT about how I might respond, I think I probably would. And so the uh, issue of the scientific um, use of information so that I might counter. Uh, but I want to stay with the um, former president, who clearly has laid out an agenda to deprive all of us of our constitutional rights, the Insurrection Act specifically, uh, and more than that. So if it's the weaponization of government that we're interested in discussing here, we have to be aware of what is imminent. A presidential candidate that has put in the public record in his own speeches that he intends to limit our civil liberties. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman recognizes, uh, the gentleman from California is now recognized five minutes. Thank you. Ambassador, you, you certainly spoke over here. You certainly spoke passionately uh, about limiting the Insurrection Act. I find that interesting when the, uh, the people of your party here uh, have used the word practically nonstop for the last three years about the actions of, of people who, uh, who uh, in a disorganized but, but terrible way did something, but they've raised it to the word Insurrection Act. Um, I would hope that that kind of, uh, that you would denounce that just as much as an excess. It is not the Civil War. It is not troops uh, trying to succeed from the Union. Um, I want to hit one more thing. Uh, since you, uh, it wasn't the subject du jour, but you made it uh, part of it today. Uh, in your time as ambassador during the Obama administration, uh, you probably wouldn't have been as thrilled when the ACLU said that the, uh, uh, they questioned the killing of al uh in Yemen. A 16-year-old American citizen born in Denver that President Obama fired uh, a predator, using a predator, uh, killed with Hellfire missiles uh, because he was such a clear and present danger uh, halfway around the world. So uh, I hope that you're just as excited if the ACLU or some other civil liberties group brings charges for the lack of due process and the killing of an American, not the attempt to capture, not the attempt to stop any other way, but killing them in another country. Um, I'm gonna bring up uh, Mr. Lynch, uh, who's a dear friend and I've traveled with and I appreciate him. He seemed to think that this hearing wasn't that important and shouldn't be on this subject, Brett, but rather other subjects. Uh, and then he left. I think he's left, yes. So, uh, Mr. Fang, I, I'm gonna ask you, uh, you're familiar with the term, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech? Yes, sir. Is it fair to say for both you and uh, 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 Ms. Richardson that the expression, if the founding fathers now were looking at uh, where we are, Congress shall make no, they might write, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech and the NSF shall award no grant that abridges speech. Is that a fair uh, extension that, that the, the grants, the money to abridge by the federal government is in fact an abridging of speech, not by Congress making a law, but by Congress appropriating money that then is used to abridge free speech? I believe the potential is there, and I think the Supreme Court has ruled that it's axiomatic that the government can't censor by proxy. And if there's evidence of that, that, that does raise alarm. Well, I'm, I'm actually getting to the, the question of money, the awarding of grants for a moment. Uh, you know, Congress shall pass no laws. Uh, the, the, uh, it's been well established that the executive branch shall not interpret a law in a way that would abridge free speech also. In other words, it doesn't just bar us from making laws, it bars the executive branch from abridging free speech. Is that correct? That's right. It, it even would bar the Article Three, the federal court, from abridging free speech. Uh, so this is not a law, even though it says Congress shall make no laws, it's constitutionally all three branches, correct? I believe so. Okay, so when uh, Track F was spending money and all the other programs you've heard mentioned today, each one of those, by definition, when they choose censorship 
They are, they are truly using federal dollars to make decisions about what speech is heard and not heard. I think the concern is certainly there. Um, you well, know, now I'm, I'm hearing the, <coughs> you're sounding like the independent you are, but uh, <laughs> you know, I'm hearing it, the, the potential. But abridging, meaning to, to limit or restrict, do, do they limit or restrict? Does any censorship, by definition, limit or, uh, uh, you know, uh, in that way? Look, if there's evidence of any of these contract, these government contract programs being used to censor Americans' speech, then of course. That's well, clearly, a clearly there was. Ms. Richardson, I, I'm just going to go to you and, and uh, both of you and uh, quickly. The, the limiting of, of, of speech, any time you write an algorithm or you influence an individual to take down or not print something, is there any question in your mind that if you wrote something as a journalist and then it didn't show up, you'd be, by definition, abridged? I think the concern here is that these algorithms are being used to target particular kinds of speech, and yes, if... if I'm, not, I'm not worried about kinds. I'm worried about speech, period. I'm, I'm trying to remember that they may take down liberal speech someday. Uh, they've actually said Mr., uh, Mr. Trump would do that if he got back in. Mr. Fang, if you wrote an article and it simply disappeared from the internet uh, all or part, would you say you were abridged? Absolutely. Okay, and I'm gonna give, because uh, you've been shaking your head so much, Mr. Lukanoff. Would you say that that is the crux of this? Not a question of whether uh, we as Republicans somehow can't be made as good using AI, but more broadly, we have a responsibility to make sure neither the Article One, nor Article Two, nor Article Three branch of government mm -hmm. shall restrict or inhibit or abridge free speech. Is that correct? Uh, uh, agreed, and it's one of the reasons why I've been a little puzzled by the hostility to the Murphy v. v. Missouri decision um, that essentially uh, limiting the power of government to coerce social media platforms into censoring um, opinions that the government itself cannot um, censor under the First Amendment should be something that there should be bipartisan agreement on. If you're afraid of the next guy abusing that power, and you, sh and you should always be, um, then you should also support the idea that jawboning is a problem. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to yield my time to the ranking member, Ms. Plaskett. Thank you, Mr. Allred, the gentleman from Texas. Um, you know, my colleague just said, worried about Trump. The Democrats are not worried about Trump taking down speech if he's reelected. We're worried about him taking down people if he's reelected. He's already silenced many of those on that side of the aisle. So many of the Republicans that I came here to Congress with are afraid of saying half of what they would really like to say about President Trump or about a lot of other issues because he has a base that they feel afraid of, that they may lose their political positions if they have true free speech in that party. So we're not worried about him taking down people's speech. At this point, he's been emboldened enough to believe that he can take people down. And that's the real fear. And that's why I have no problem with Ms. Richardson, Mr. Fang, Mr. Lykanoff, is uh -huh. that? Uh, Lukianoff. Lukianoff, being here to be witnesses, the information they're giving is interesting. It's something we should consider. But there are other issues going on also that we can have a discussion about in this committee, and you won't. That's what's incredulous about the fact that we've been doing this six times, is that you haven't interspersed it with any other topic. That's, that's the concern. But I wanted to ask uh, the ambassador about an agency that I have a tremendous amount of respect for, and of course, it's, I'm a little biased. I worked in at the Department of Justice for a Republican president as a Republican political appointee. I worked for in the Civil Division for Robert McCallum, who later became President George W. Bush's ambassador to Australia. I worked for Larry Thompson, the Deputy Attorney General. Worked for James Comey, who at the time was the Deputy Attorney General. 
And Mr. Trump, President Trump, has said he would use the DOJ and actually attempted to use it as his own personal law firm when he was president. He tried to bully prosecutors out of pros to prosecute his friends, um, out of prosecuting his friends and MAGA loyalists. He pressured the DOJ to target Democrats and political appointments. He tried to force senior DOJ leadership to pursue election fraud cases in the states he lost to Joe Biden. If he gets a second term, he's made it clear that those disturbing actions are just the beginning. Um, there are walls between the White House and DOJ, intentionally built to keep our prosecutors objective and our law enforcement system trustworthy. He wants to tear that wall with, in, with his presidency. Ambassador Eisen, a recent report claims that Trump intends to appoint a loyalist to head the DOJ's Office of Legal Counsel who will write an opinion dramatically expanding presidential immunity. Given the uh, appellate court's decision today, what we understand about presidential immunity, can you explain to the American public what that would mean to our democracy? It would mean danger, grave danger, Ms. Plaskett. The Office of Legal Counsel uh, are lawyers' lawyers. They are the in-house law firm, essentially, of the Department of Justice, of the federal agencies, and of the executive branch. The opinions that they offer on the law govern uh, what the executive branch does. Um, I didn't always agree with them when I was in the White House, and I had to deal with them. But they ultimately say what the law is. And if they were to say that a president had the absolute immunity to order SEAL Team 6 to commit an assassination, today's opinion, as important as it is, a milestone in American law that the D.C. Circuit has given us, but as important as it is, it only applies to former presidents. If I may say, that's why I think the Supreme Court may, we don't know, they may deny cert. It's a very narrow holding today. That, unfortunately, leaves a wide field of battle. And I know that my friends do not want that kind of, on either side of the aisle, do not that, want that kind of power for the federal government. Very dangerous. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, gentleman yields back. The gentleman from uh, Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Once again, we are here today to hear about the Biden administration's efforts to censor the speech of American citizens. In a seemingly unending series of examples from across the federal government, we have seen public servants use taxpayer resources to shut down certain disfavored viewpoints. This is fundamentally un-American and violates free speech. Thanks to the tremendous work done by Mrs. Richardson, we know that the National Science Foundation spent millions of taxpayer dollars on artificial intelligence research conducted at elite universities like the University of Michigan, University of Wisconsin, and MIT. Although AI has the potential to be a powerful tool, it can also be used for many nefarious purposes that infringes upon the liberty of American citizens. Unfortunately, it seems the recipients of these NSF grants were doing just that by developing AI tools to censor disfavored speech. Effectively, the American people are being forced to subsidize their own censorship. Researchers at the University of Michigan were even so brazen to market their WiseDex technology as a way for social media companies to, quote, externalize the difficult responsibility of censorship. The fact that they believe censorship is a responsibility is extremely concerning, especially when the government is the entity funding such censorship. MIT's team of researchers were even more candid when they stated in a project proposal that certain segments of the population, including military veterans and military families, are particularly susceptible to, quote, misinformation campaigns. Thus, they argue that it is necessary to have a proactive suite of human technologies to counteract this supposed misinformation because reactive content moderation is too slow and ineffective. In other words, the elites at MIT think that my fellow veterans and I are too dumb to think for ourselves. These efforts to use AI to censor the thoughts of American citizens is truly disturbing. There are a small group of elites who believe they alone can discern objective truth and alternative viewpoints they deem misinformation must be suppressed. Now they seek to use the powerful tool that is artificial intelligence to help them censor disfavored opinions and the American taxpayer is being forced to foot the bill. 
Mr. Fong, I'd like to uh, start with you. You've recently written about NewsGuard, which is a company that works closely with the government and major corporate advertisers by scoring news websites as a sort of misinformation meter. As you reported, NewsGuard has received a $749,000 contract from the DOD. Can you describe some of the free speech concerns that you've seen regarding NewsGuard? Well, NewsGuard is one of the many kind of firms in this cottage industry of anti-misinformation. Uh, they provide tools to rank websites on their kind of truthiness, and they have their own sliding scale. Uh, the problem here is that they've been caught over and over again um, getting the facts wrong. They claim that uh, any website or news outlet that reported on the COVID lab leak as the origin of COVID-19 was spreading a conspiracy theory. They've also gone after left-leaning websites that are simply reporting on the Ukraine-Russia war in a critical way, saying that Ukraine is a client state of the US. Perhaps you disagree with this point of view, but this isn't a conspiracy theory. This is a legitimate area of public debate. Now, this is a, NewsGuard in particular is another company that, as you mentioned, receives military contracts. If they're working for the military and shaping public opinion and journalism around issues of foreign policy, for me, that raises inherent conflicts of interest. It's basically like a, I was in the military. It's basically like a PSYOP mission that they're doing using taxpayer dollars to PSYOP American citizens. I'd like to uh, ask unanimous consent to put into the record his, Mr. Fong's article, In the Name of Fake News, NewsGuard exhorts sites to follow the government narrative. Without objection. Uh, Ms. Richardson, in the little time I have left, I, as I, note, I noted in my comments, MIT researchers thought they needed to protect veterans and military families, among other populations, from misinformation campaigns. Should we be concerned that such biases held by the creators of these powerful technology will especially harm populations like veterans and military families? I think that is the concern, is that the people who are creating these technologies are letting their biases influence how they play out and who, the, who they are censoring through these tools. So yes, I do think whether it's right or left, we need to understand that these tools can be used to censor Americans. And Mr. Lukanoff, I saw you sh shaking your head during some of my comments. Uh, in the 38 seconds I have left, if you'd like to add to that. I'd, oh, oh, I'd sure, I'd time. actually want to talk specifically about the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the data index, basically like the misinformation index, the, C <laughs> the CDI. Um, it listed not only, uh, as far as the riskiest online news outlets, it listed the New York Post, Real Clear Politics, The Daily Wire, The Blaze, One American News Network, The Federalist, Newsmax, The American Spectator, The American Conservative, and worst of all, in my opinion, Reason Magazine, that even though I know not everyone's a libertarian, but as some of the smartest people I know and some of the smartest reporting I've seen come out of Reason Magazine, and this is being treated as de facto misinformation. All conservative websites. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Chairman, I just uh, want to remind all of us that um, everyone's words matter, uh, and as Ambassador Eisen has pointed out, what our leaders say in particular really do matter. So when the twice impeached, four times indicted former president talks about being a dictator, I really don't think that's a joke. I think he's for real. For four years, Trump turned the federal government into a horrifying weapon for his own personal gain, to serve his racist goals, punish his enemies, and to attack reality. Trump weaponized the federal government in many ways, but most horrifically, he put children in cages, and he weaponized ICE and immigration to a point of instituting mass deportations, sending ICE to round up immigrants at schools and hospitals, he traumatized those children for a lifetime. And MAGA Republicans across the country are simply just following suit. They want to please him. They want to see him be happy. Greg Abbott, our governor in my state of Texas, seemingly seems to be auditioning uh, for Mr. Trump to pick him as vice president or perhaps a member of his cabinet because Abbott has has erected a razor wire barrier along the Texas-Mexican border as part of his auditioning. I don't know how familiar folks here are with razor wire. I've been to Eagle Pass. I've seen what they've done. They have anchored giant buoys with table saw blades in the river. When children try to swim across, they get caught. They panic and some may drown. If you look at this poster, you can clearly see a child in agony 
You can tell from his face that he's crying. He's begging. He's kneeling in front of a Texas guard put there by Governor Abbott to prevent anyone from coming through, even Border Patrol, to do their job. Cruelty seems to be his game. But I think what Greg Abbott continues to do is undermining what it is to be human. He is doing this to children, and that's how low we've come. This is straight out of a dictator's playbook. Ambassador Eisen, when Greg Abbott and Donald Trump talk about the only thing that they can't do now is shoot immigrants, or some may say that they got what they've got coming to them. What message is that sending to the public and to the rest of the world? Ms. Garcia, uh, the committee, the chair, the ranking member have been very generous today in allowing me to offer my policy analysis together with my personal history. My father, who I referred to earlier, came to this country as an undocumented migrant when he arrived in 1940 on that last ship, the last ship to leave Athens, the port of Athens, for the United States during World War II. He had a transit visa, and he stayed and joined the Army and earned his citizenship that way. So as the child of an undocumented migrant, your question hits me where I live. Of course, we have to have reasonable compromises on immigration. We can agree or disagree, and part of compromise is you never get what you want. That is, I was talking with Mr. Issa before about Chairman Hyde, who I got to know as a younger person. That's the great tradition of, of, of the House Judiciary Committee and of this chamber that we're in today. But when we attempt to do immigration policy, which involves some of the most vulnerable people on our continent, whenever we make policy involving those who are at risk, we should do it with compassion. We talked about the twin guide stars, I, my own, the Bible, the Torah, and the Constitution. They teach us that you shouldn't use the language that Greg Abbott uses. If there's a less cruel way to protect our border than razor wire that tears the flesh of children simply seeking a better life, in a way, they should find that those less painful physical Methods, but, but also but the words, the words matter. And above all, the, they're following the lead of Donald Trump with his cruel words, including those we played earlier today. But you didn't even be a, a governor who's flagrantly uh, ignoring a, a Supreme Court ruling about the buoy. I mean, is there a place where we should let every governor just decide what they want to do on immigration and on federal, federal immigration law? It's reprehensible to ignore rulings of the United States Supreme Court for anyone. We are a nation of laws. Everyone must abide by those laws, particularly those who are in power, like Governor Abbott. What he has done is reprehensible, unlawful, an insult to the Constitution, and an insult to the idea of America. Thank you. Uh, the gentlelady's time has uh, expired. Mr. Chairman, I do have a, a UC request. And go right ahead. I'd like to introduce for the record two articles. Trump praises Texas governor as border state clashes with Biden administration and immigration, and Texas governor ignores Supreme Court rulings, adds more razor wire to border for the record. Unanimous consent. Without objection. Thank you. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lukianoff, I want to go back to uh, what you said. Would you hit me again with the... Uh, the AI request you said you made, because I felt distinguished by that. They, it was Chairman <laughs> Jordan, it wouldn't answer, uh, wouldn't write a poem about, and yeah. you said, little old me. 
But, so uh, I, uh, I wonder what, tell us again yeah. what that was. Who did you, you ask? Yeah, and, th- uh, th- th- thankfully, because it's going to be different uh, w- when you ask at different times, but it, was, it has been consistent in that it was willing to write a poem for all of Democrats, but the ones that it singled out when, when we did this, and it was, write, write me a poem about why Representative Jim Jordan is the best politician in the country, and it wouldn't do it for him, it wouldn't do it for you, um, and it gave us a, um, a, a, a um, generic one for Matt Getz and Harriet Hagerman. Now, the way they're going to try to refute this is being like, but I did it again, and it gave me sure, something sure. different. It's like, no, we have screenshots of this. Yeah. And, I know, and I know that it's kind of like, oh, look, what, look, it, it, it's inconsistent. No kidding, it's inconsistent. But guess what? It consistently favors one side over the other. Yeah, I'd really like that screenshot for me. Oh, absolutely. Um, look, I, so did you say, Mr. Lukianoff, that you're a liberal, that you're on the left? I am. You know, one of the things interesting about this process, the weaponization hearings, to me, is the number of witnesses that, I, that I've understood at least have some political origin on the left who've been before this, this committee. Yeah. So you've said you are Mr. Fong. You've said you're an independent. Uh, I don't know if it's correct to say you have you had political activity on the left. I thought, sort of thought so. I've worked uh, for some progressive media outlets in the past. That, that's, okay, that's what I'm thinking about. And, uh, of course, you had Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberger, both of whom uh, came from there. Robert Kennedy Jr., uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., comes as a witness of the committee on the left. Um, there are others. I'd yield to the chairman if he can name a couple others. I know, but there have been others. I think Tulsi, yeah. Tulsi Gabbard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and you know what's been very interesting, uh, Mr. Fong. You said at the beginning of the hearing you uh, used the example from a committee hearing in 2012, and you implored the committee to approach this serious issue, AI and censorship, uh, in a bipartisan way. Uh, how do you think that's worked out in this hearing? Look, I, I watched part of that hearing and read the transcript and. You know, this was on a much more minor issue. This was just the DHS contracting to monitor social media, not censor, not interject, not work with the FBI to pressure social media to take down posts. This was arguably a much more benign issue. And in that hearing, you had both sides, Republicans and Democrats, raising very legitimate privacy concerns, free speech concerns. And it wasn't partisan. It was both sides working together to discuss these common principles. Yeah, what about this hearing? Has it worked out bipartisan way as far as you're, you're concerned? Uh, not, not so much. Yeah, it seemed like to <laughs> me everybody, every person, the memo on the other side of the aisle was, uh, was to get up, go after Donald Trump and every thing, which is fine, I mean, whatever. But it, 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 it implies that there's nothing to this issue. Oh. Isn't that right, Mr. Lukianoff? You got you got this stuff. You got machines possibly taking down whole trains of thought across social media from the dialogue across the world. Yeah. And 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 everyone. I mean, implicitly, if you're saying, "Oh, I just want to talk about Donald Trump," don't think that's that's a, that's suggesting there's nothing to that. It, it, what what accounts for that? You guys are leftists. We've had some of the left, not leftists. I'm sorry, but people on the left who've come as witnesses, and they've been some have been trashed. Some of them had their demand for their sources, uh, you know, from the other side, and then you know, they had the FTC chase down one of them. Just crazy stuff. Why is that the case? It's, it's, it's extremely frustrating. Um, and in my latest book, we talk about this as the perfect rhetorical fortress. We take on right and left in the book. Uh, yeah. We talk about defeating the Stop Woke Act in court, for, uh, for example. But we talk about the simple act of labeling someone as being on one side or the other means you, I don't have to listen to them anymore. So you'll see that the, and the, the number of people who are now accused of being right wing, I call this fascio casting, declaring someone fascist and suddenly you don't have to listen to them anymore. It's a, it's a childish tactic, but it's become increasingly common to a point where I'm actually seeing scholars claiming that now the ACLU and the New York Times are right wing because it worked with everybody else. Why not scare them out of uh, being credible if we can just label them something that sounds mean? It sounds pretty grave, Dan for the society, if that's where Congress devolves to. Mr. Fong, I'm going to give you the rest of my time. What we've done in some of these hearings is also bring out some of the people, like Richard Stengel and uh, 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 Pablo Brewer, who have been involved in various aspects. The one you bring out, Brian Murphy, former uh, DHS, former FBI official, writes, the executive branch is most well-equipped to intervene against foreign covert speech proliferating in the homeland. A lot of what happens in the cognitive warfare warfare space domestically has been transferred over to the social media companies, and you'll hear politicians on all sides saying that social media companies need to be better policers. I agree with that, but he goes on to say, but it part of the social contract in a liberal democracy is between the citizens and the executive branch where you give up some of your freedom so you get security back. That troubles me. Is that something that people should be troubled by, and who is he? 
Yeah, this is a former Trump official, the former intelligence director of the DHS, who created dossiers on journalists who engaged in inappropriate surveillance of left-wing activists. Um, the very problem that we've heard discussed at this committee, he's now at an anti-misinformation AI firm, and he's basically said very openly that the problem with the Disinformation Governance Board was not, you know, violating civil liberties or free speech. The problem was that it was too out front. It was, you know, too obvious of a, of a political entity. They said, he said that, that it should basically be reconstructed using third parties, that the government should take the back end and work with journalists, with nonprofit groups, and with companies like his own to police misinformation. Thank you for informing the world. I yield. Well done. Uh, gentleman from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Bishop, I'm happy to write you a poem. Uh, if you like. I can't wait. Um, but, you know, I, I want to go back to something you say, which is uh, some memo or whatever that all we want to do is talk about Donald Trump. Um, the fact of the matter is that this committee, which may go down as one of the most useless and worthless subcommittees ever created by Congress, hey. is called the weaponization of the federal government. And the reason we all know now that this was created and stood up is that the Republicans are trying to flip the script and to distract from the fact that the true weaponization of the federal government with evidence and facts and support was done by Donald Trump and his administration and will be done by Donald Trump and any future administration. Now, this also goes back to uh, 2016 and the fact that Special Counsel Robert Mueller, the uh, unanimous opinion of the intelligence community, um, pretty much everyone who looked at this concluded that Russia used false information on social media to interfere, uh, interfere in our 2016 election. And the problem the Republicans want to rebut and undermine and distract from is that they did so to help Republican candidate. And so if you attack the Democrats as the real weaponizers of the federal government, then you get to flip the script and turn it on the Democrats and say, oh no, they are, and get to continue doing and opening up the avenues for additional real weaponization of the federal government. Now, Mr. Lukinov, do, do, you, uh, do you think there is a First Amendment right to um, distribute deep fakes online? Is there a First Amendment right to distribute deep fakes online? Of course there is. Okay. Now, do you think that there is a First Amendment right to distribute deep fakes online uh, with the intent to interfere in an election? Uh, if you add additional steps to it, it can potentially be criminal. Oh, we need to sure, right. but to okay. create them, so distribute them. I'm, I'm not even going to yeah. waste our time getting into this because yeah. what you have just highlighted yes. and, and agreed to is that this is a very difficult issue. The balance between the First Amendment and what is free speech and but what is respectively, hold Congressman, on, hold on. I'm not, I'm not asking questions at all. Sir, I didn't ask a question. You said this was a useless hearing. I didn't and then ask you, you a question, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to reclaim my time. The gentleman has the time. That the, the problem that we are facing in the post-2016 world where social media is used as a weapon uh, to interfere in elections from foreign uh, governments is that this is a difficult thing to navigate, that balancing the First Amendment, which all Democrats support, but the First Amendment is not absolute. There's obviously some speech that is not protected. And balancing the interests of free and fair elections um, is a complicated situation. What is not complicated is, and, and by the way, by the way, there's, there, you know, this has been the theme of this committee for the whole year. They've, I believe the, the committee has interviewed more than 30 witnesses, and every single witness behind closed doors has said that the government has never coerced, pressured, or threatened any social media company into taking any action. The whole premise of this theory falls apart. What we should be focusing on is Chairman Jordan abusing the power of his 
committee in the Congress to subpoena state prosecutors in an effort to undermine their prosecutions of his revered friend, Donald Trump. That is no place for Congress to be, no place for the committee to be. That is a true weaponization of the federal government. And when we start talking about other things that are the real weaponization of the federal government, such as Donald Trump's statements that he will just indict his political enemies, or that he would use the Insurrection Act to deploy the military against civil protesters, or even that he had argued his, his lawyers, uh, one of whom has appeared twice here as one of our favorite witnesses, John Sauer, actually said that if Donald Trump ordered SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival, it could not be a crime unless he was impeached. Somehow that is a predicate. The fact of the matter is the true weaponization, the threat of weaponization is from Donald Trump and the Republicans, and we ought to move on from this charade. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Florida is recognized. General Lee, yield. Uh, yes, I'd like to yield 15 seconds to the chairman. Yeah, I would just point out that the, the description of the committee's work by the member from New York might carry a little might carry a little weight if he wasn't the same guy who, in our last hearing, said that social media companies only took action on 35 percent of the demands from the government. So this is a guy who thinks 35 percent censorship is okay, and now he's describing our. Well, work the gentleman yields for a question. It's the no. general. It's a general lady's time. I yield back. No, I uh, There's a mischaracterization so, of what I said. Uh, you know. Uh, I find it incredible the the alternate reality that Representative uh, Goldman is living in. I mean, he just stated that there has never been an occasion in which the White House, the Biden White House, has threatened or pressured White House uh, social media companies to take down social media posts. But I have timestamps. I have emails. We come with receipts. I mean, I can February 6, 2021, 9:45 p.m. Rob Flattery. White House official demanding Twitter take down a parody of Finnegan Biden, Hunter Biden's adult daughter. And we have all the receipts on this. I mean, we can go over this over and over again, but it would be a waste of time. Denying reality, as my colleagues on the left continue to do, is a disservice to the American people. I, I just I, I cannot believe that this is where we are at. But uh, I'm going to jump right into this. Um, uh, we're trying to address essentially digital authoritarianism. That's what we're, we're contending with. So uh, I find it ridiculous that my colleagues on the left can only and will only talk about Donald Trump as though this is not a real issue that everyday Americans, Republicans, independents, Democrats are facing. So Ms. Richardson, while investigating these NF NSF grants, and the NSF Convergence Research, was there any documentation or communication regarding the philosophical foundation of the language models being used in the AI uh, tools? Some of the grant descriptions themselves talk about areas that they are specifically interested in seeing, controlling, in, in discussing misinformation in, and these areas, um, some of these grants focused on election misinformation, some of them focused on vaccine misinformation, um, so, the, the, yes. Okay, so uh, there was philosophical discussions about the, the language models themselves that these particular grant awardees would be using. Um, I, I think that a lot of these grant descriptions expressed exactly what they were going to be investigating. Did they talk about open source language models as part of a requirement for this research? Uh, some, some of these grants were, they're analyzing different sets of data. Some of them wanted to do keyword searches um, to analyze what kinds of posts they were searching for. But I think, uh, I think what we're getting at here, the heart of this, is that there was no clear guidance on the particular set of language models that they were supposed to be using. Ms. Richardson, have you been able to determine the political affiliations of the project leads? Well, some of them, just based on what these, again, I'm just going based off of what the grants state publicly. Um, the, the topics that they are considering seem to be targeting specific kinds of speech. Okay. Now, the University of Michigan put together a slide deck that was submitted to the NSF. On the overview slide, the mission of their grant, as explained, was 
quote, our misinformation service helps policymakers at social media platforms get good PR for their actions on misinformation by having a clear benchmark for outcomes and eliminating the need to defend internal procedures. Yikes. The slide deck also notes, uh, also notes that they do things that we know work without backlash and that, quote, we push responsibility for difficult judgments to someone outside of the company, end quote. It goes on to say, we get people off our backs for how we act on misinformation. And it goes on to say that we eliminate the need to defend specific procedures. Now, this is an NSF, taxpayer-funded project, and they say we eliminate the need to defend specific procedures as though accountability is more of a suggestion, more of a yellow light. So, Mr. Fong, Mr. Lukanov, the NSF vision states that they, quote, strive to create a nation that leads the world in science and engineering research and innovation to the benefit of all without barriers to participation. Given what I just told you about the University of Michigan's own worked product that was funded by U.S. taxpayers, does it not seem like the mission of the NSF and the grants that they are funding are fundamentally at odds? And does this create concerns for the American people and the agencies for mission creep? and infringement on constitutional rights. And I'm short on time, so short answers. Oh, I, I think the uh, mission of actually trying to seek out microaggressions shows a very poor, it's a very unscientific idea that we can have an AI that can make that kind of cultural decisions about politeness norms and impose it on everyone else. Thank you. I, I can't comment directly on NSF, but just generally, a lot of these groups that claim to be nonpartisan, look at their record, they become partisan, that claim to represent science, they end up representing a corporate interest. They claim to be supporting and upholding facts, end up censoring true and accurate information. We just need a lot better uh, guardrails for this type of thing, a lot better disclosure. I appreciate that. I yield. General Lee yields back to the ranking members recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the loyalty test that the president has talked about, President Trump. Um, Trump has said that he plans to make all federal career employees 50,000 fireable at will by the president, and that this will allow him to gut those agencies' career experts and fill the position with individuals who will do what he requests. These non-political career employees have spent decades building their knowledge and expertise and possess invaluable experience that brings continuity to our government across different administrations. This is the thing that stops the agencies from being political. I remember as a political appointee being called the Christmas help by the career employees that were there with great reason because they are there, they are the bulwarks. Ambassador Eisen, what would be the impact on our national security if Trump were to fire large swaths of our experienced workforce and fill those positions with largely unqualified MAGA loyalists. Uh, Ms. Plaskett, like yourself as someone who has served in our government and uh, in, including in a um, national security position as a United States ambassador, one of the great honors of my life, the effect would be devastating when I worked in the State Department, I counted on mm -hmm. the independent opinions. And do not think that the over 200 State Department employees or the thousands back in Foggy Bottom who I dealt with always agreed with me. They often gave me an independent judgment and they disagreed with me and I changed our course of action. Why? And I prided myself, on, frankly, on that independence myself. I had a nickname in the White House, Mr. No, and worse nicknames from my own colleagues <laughs> in the Obama administration. I've heard some about you. So. Uh, indeed. But why? Because when our government makes national security decisions or domestic ones, the lives of the American people of our service people, like my dad, who served in the US Army, who are deployed all over the world, and the lives of our allies are at stake. We must have independent judgment. And if you put in a loyalty test, if you fire people by the tens of thousands, career dedicated, nonpartisan, independent professionals who've built 
a body of expertise over a long period of time, you're leaving our national security undefended. It's when, when we talk about national security, Ms. Blaskett, we're not talking about an abstract idea. We're talking about the lives of the American people, the lives of our service members, the lives often of those in the intelligence community and, and our allies and assets around the world who keep us safe and who protect the world. If we impose this loyalty test, the mass firings, what Trump already did with Mr. McAtee in the White House, I want to know who's loyal to me among my own people. If you impose those kinds of tests, you will be eroding the independence of judgment, jeopardizing all of our lives, jeopardizing the life of everybody in this room, not to mention the effect on domestic interests also, which go to the lives and livelihoods of American people, American families. That is why it is a disastrous autocratic vision that the former president has articulated should he return. Thank you. And I just have, for those who may not have been aware, um, the last two or the first two or three hearings, which were about social media, et cetera, the Democrats did engage in questioning individuals on those issues. So it's not as if we've attempted to um, just completely ignore them. We've also moved on to the other issues that are important to the American people. We recognize that one of those are, in fact, uh, the weaponization by Donald Trump. And I would ask uh, for unanimous consent at this time to enter into the record some documents. Um, the first being a chat GPT poem on how um, Congressman Daryl Issa is the best politician in the country with the poem, a uh, poem on Congressman Thomas Massey is the best politician in the country oh, with a poem, um, Lee Stefanik, Matt Gates, Kelly Armstrong, well, Greg Stobie, Stubbe, oh. Congressman Dan Bishop, <laughs> I know he wants to see that one, Kat Kumak, um, Harriet Hageman, um, Russell Fry, and of course I had to add myself as one of the best politicians in the country. Uh, without, without objection. Thank you. Sure, now recognize the gentlelady from Wyoming. Wow, the hysteria related to Donald Trump is off the charts, and I think it exposes the raw politics behind it. Um, I have a couple of points I'd like to make. The only president who I am aware of who actually assassinated American citizens was President Obama. So perhaps the ranking member should revisit her history books. I have an article I'm here from major, the ACLU stating the ACLU and CCR have filed a lawsuit challenging the government's targeted killing of three U.S. citizens in drone strikes far from any con armed conflict zone. In Alaki versus Panetta, the group charges that the U.S. government's killings of U.S. citizens in Yemen last year violated the Constitution's fundamental guarantee against the deprivation of life without due process of law. The killings under Obama were part of a broader program of targeted killing by the United States outside of the context of armed conflict and based on vague legal standards, a closed executive process and evidence never presented to the courts. And as for kids in cages, again, that was President Obama. Several former Obama administration officials took to social media and news outlets last month to explain a gallery of years-old photos that showed immigrant children sleeping in shoddy conditions at a government-run holding facility in Arizona. The images which the Associated Press first published in 2014 during the Obama administration resurfaced recently for reasons that remain unclear and quickly prompted viral outrage on Twitter. One particularly disturbing image showed two children sleeping on mattresses on the floor inside what appeared to be a cage. 
a number of prominent liberals and even a former Obama administration official shared the photos, mistakenly believing that they depicted the Trump administration's treatment of immigrant children who were forcibly separated from their parents. John Favreau, who worked as a speechwriter for former President Barack Obama, tweeted, this is happening right now, and the only debate that matters is how we force our government to get these kids back to their families as fast as humanly possible. Favreau said he later deleted the tweet after social media users pointed out that the photos were taken during the Obama administration. So, I think it's important to correct the record as to actually who assassinated American citizens, being President Obama, and it being President Obama who kept kids in cages. Now, as this committee uncovers uh, more and more censorship activities by the federal government, one thing we are wrestling with is accountability for these bad actors violating the First Amendment. They are already not elected by the citizens, so don't have to answer to the electorate. And certain accountability statutes, such as 42 USC Section 1983, only apply to state employees, which is why Mr. Bishop and I have introduced the Censorship Accountability Act to actually hold federal employees personally liable for violating the First Amendment of American citizens. But even in those circumstances one, where one can go to courts for relief, that requires a great deal of time and resources to, provide, to prove liability, harm, and then obtain relief. Uh, it is apparent from the ongoing Missouri versus Biden case that all of these bad actors, it makes it difficult to eventually hold them accountable. Ms. Richardson, I highlight these things to show that accountability can be hard to achieve for injured Americans. Do you think this could be further exacerbated if certain activities that facilitate censorship are increasingly done by AI systems rather than government employees? I do. I think that what these tools open the potential for is broader censorship and done without having to have an individual employee sitting there doing it. They're able to flag posts um, at, a, at a larger scale. So I do think the fact that the NSF is funding them is concerning. Well, in the upscaling of AI technology can provide censorship operations, and the scope of it is absolutely astonishing. For example, in its pitch to the NSF, Meaden stated, stated that it was using AI to monitor 750,000 blogs and media articles daily, as well as to mine data from the major social media platforms. That just gives you an idea of the absolute scope of what AI could do for violating people's First Amendment rights. In your testimony, Ms. Richardson, you outlined in great detail the number of grants, the large sums, and the various number of partners that the federal do dollars are going to to censor American citizens in violation of the First Amendment. What can the proliferation of this type of technology do to the censorship industrial complex, which has already been uncovered, if it is not properly overseen for beneficial development? Well, I think what we've seen through, as you just brought up, the Missouri v. Biden case and Twitter files and many other aspects is this increasing involvement of the federal government with private parties in order to censor speech. And this is just another example of that, federal government funding universities, funding companies to develop these tools that allow censorship at a broader scale. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman Lady yields back. Um, we, for our witnesses, we have 10 more minutes. Uh, I know you've been sitting there for a while, but if you can hang with us 10 more, that'd be, and then we'll have a few maybe closing comments from the ranking member, myself, and then we'll, we'll uh, conclude our hearing. I want to recognize our newest member, our two newest members. Uh, first, the gentleman from Ohio is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I thank the chairman, thank our witnesses. It is an honor to be on the Weaponization Committee. It's disappointing that Congress needed to create this committee, but it definitely needed to be done. Uh, the American people rightly recognize that our own government is being turned against its citizens. The Bill of Rights was put in place by the Founding Fathers fundamentally because in the first days of the Constitution, the concern was that the federal government would somehow be used and turned against not just the states, but the citizens of those states. And today we're seeing the Bill of Rights being trampled in every kind of way. We see freedom of religion. Oh, you can have it, just don't exercise it. Freedom of speech, the right to assemble, uh, all of the First Amendment trampled. The Second Amendment, people want to trample it. 
I would say the third has been trampled as well. You have to provide provision for government on everything from a cell phone to a laptop to your car. Now, maybe even digital ID, all kinds of things. People are supporting every kind of infringement, warrantless spying on American citizens, government agencies buying data that they would otherwise have to get a warrant or a subpoena and on down the list through the entire Bill of Rights. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? And I think this committee is a good response to it. Um, today, we're focusing on AI, and um, you know, I just, when you think about AI, how do you assess, you know, whether the uh, algorithm has got it right? Is it a question of which speech gets canceled? Because that seems to be the case, and the reality is, while some of this activity went on under the previous administration, in the early days of the Biden administration, they wanted to formalize it. They didn't call it a ministry of truth. They came up with the Disinformation Governance Board. But Mr. Lukianoff, what's the state of play in recognizing when free speech is, frankly, be, have, have, people are having their free speech rights canceled? Um, I would turn us to the less sexy and less sci-fi scenario of what's going on in American college campuses. Um, I feel like I'm on the free speech left. I feel like I've been screaming at the sky trying to get people to take seriously the threats to free speech on campus for a long time now. 2020 and 2021 were the highest number of professors fired, and they were on the left and the right, to be clear, um, that I'm aware of since probably the night of, for two year, two year period since probably the 1930s. Um, and this is something that is not getting sufficient uh, attention. Now, who programs AI? Overwhelmingly elite uh, the college graduates who actually, when you poll them, have some pretty distressing ideas about freedom of speech. Uh, think about the idea of us all living on the most repressive college campus, um, and that's why we should be afraid of what AI potentially could become if we don't actually take this issue a little more seriously. Yeah, uh, so thank you about that, for that. And when you think about, uh, you know, AI and the language models that are used, mm -hmm. how do you know what the primary sources are? You know, when you're looking at the uh, way that speech is canceled on campus, there are, you know, some people are disfavored. Maybe some campuses won't allow Congressman Jordan on their campus, or maybe some won't allow our ranking member on campus. And uh, they might view it as good because the other person got canceled. Uh, we can all recognize that as some limitation of, of speech, but when you look at the algorithm, you just know what got, you don't really get to see what was filtered. So, uh, Mr. Fang, Ms. Richardson, do you have thoughts about the, uh, you know, how we, how we detect this kind of activity in AI? Well, look, it's not, not my role as a journalist to prescribe any particular solution, but I would want to point at the example in the UK where they have a little bit stronger data laws. A lot of the people who are censored during the pandemic for simply criticizing the efficacy of some of the vaccines, discussing some of these pandemic lockdowns, the way that they were able to find out that they were surveilled and then censored is that they were able to make requests with some of the UK's data laws for the government and these private sector firms to provide their own data to them. And that's how they found out. We don't have those same strong protections in the US. Perhaps it's worth looking at uh, stronger rights to your own data, better algorithm, algorithmic transparency. Um, this is worth debating. Thank you for that, and I'll yield the balance of my time to the chairman. Uh, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, well, actually, I, I, don't, I don't have time in 30 seconds to get to it, but I, I appreciate it. I'll yield it back to the fine gentleman if he has another question. Uh, I, I look forward to the work of the committee. As I said, it's important, but uh, just to pick up where you left off, Mr. Fang, you know, we've worked on a bill for a while called the It's Your Data Act that would recognize a property right in American citizens' data. And when you look at the, one of the most trampled rights that uh, the Bill of Rights is supposed to protect, it would be the right to privacy. So I hope we reclaim it. The gentleman yields back. Um, uh, appreciate that. The, the uh, gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to yield to you two minutes. I appreciate it. Um, I just want to start with what, what the, you know, we've heard a lot about, you know, criticizing President Trump, uh, which I thought was, you know, over, overtly political and, and just wrong. But um, I wanted to flag a tweet, and I brought, I brought this up several times before. This is on January 23rd, 2021, Clark Humphrey, Executive Office of the President, the White House. And he sends this tweet to Twitter, or excuse me, tweet, this email to Twitter, excuse me. Uh, and he says, hey, this is again, the White House, 
January 23rd, third day of the administration, wanted to flag the below tweet, and I'm wondering if we can get moving on the process for having it removed, and then in all caps, ASAP. This is government telling Twitter, take it down, and you can't do it soon enough. And the tweet, of course, is from Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And he has in this tweet, I think, two sentences. Hank Aaron's tragic death is part of a wave of suspicious deaths among elderly closely following administration of the vaccine. He received the Moderna vaccine, he being Hank Aaron, received the Moderna vaccine on January 5th to inspire other black Americans to get the vaccine. Two sentences, both actually true. It's tragic what happened to Hank Aaron, but two sentences, both true, and the White House says, take it down. Is that appropriate, Mr. Lukanoff? <laughs> I, I, I certainly don't think so. And I'm afraid of the government treating us like we are children. Um, I can read that, and I'm capable as a, as a citizen with a brain of my own to decide what I make of it. Um, but it, oh, go on. I just want to add a, add a layer to it. And the irony here is, this is the third day of the administration, and they're going after their Democrat primary political opponent. Mm -hmm. That says it all. Two statements that are true. We cannot let the American people, us hillbillies from the rural area, as it said, in the, we can't let you decide if this is something you should see or not. So we, the Biden White House, are going to have this, try to have this taken down. And oh, by the way, it just happens to be our political opponent. That sums it all up. And I would just ask Mr. Ice, and then I'll yield back to my colleague. Is that appropriate? And I don't want your long, long dialogue. I just want a <laughs> yes or no. Uh... No, not an uh, a yes or a no. Uh, I'm attempting to condense it into a yes or no, uh, Mr. It's Jordan. It's pretty simple. Should the government be doing that to their political opposition on day three of the administration, where it's two statements that are absolutely true? And you've been so courteous. I yield to, back to my colleagues. You've been so courteous answer. to me I, today. I, I, Hank Aaron's to death my, was not related to COVID-19. New York Times. Ha Hank Aaron's death is falsely linked to COVID to vaccine. New York South Times. Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for, for that. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. Where do you think that comes from, Mr. Ackerman? <laughs> 1984. Yes, exactly. You know, this, this book was written in the 1940s, right? And if you read it, it's about kind of this ministry of truth. We are here today, are we not? Mm -hmm. I mean, the prophetic fiction is really not fiction when you look at where we are as a country today. Would you agree with that? Well, I call my subsect the eternally radical idea because I believe in every generation brave people rise up to oppose freedom of speech and they are usually on the winning side. Uh, the specter of Big Brother, the specter of greater control is always around us and we've been very lucky to grow up in a period in which we have enjoyed great free speech, but we must not take that for granted. You know, it's interesting, if we sat around and had a beer or coffee, we would disagree on a lot of things, oh, yeah. right? And, and so, but again, we go back to the founding of this country and the intent of the framers in protecting that freedom of speech. And so here, uh, what we're here for today, which isn't Donald Trump, it's actually about artificial intelligence and its suppression, or potential suppression, of freedom of speech. And so we have the National Science Foundation that has gifted out grants. And in order to get the grant, you have to apply for it. And in the application for these grants, the University of Michigan said, quote, it was, we were underco uh, undergoing the difficult responsibility of censorship, end quote. And so the dystopian things in 1984 that we have seen in, in a fictional book are now here. And so AI, we've kind of talked about this today, but AI can be manipulated. The algorithms can be manipulated by people who are fallible and who are inherently biased. Is that correct? Yeah, and it's certainly happening in, in, in dictatorships like China. Right, and so AI is inherently biased because of the programmatic things that are put in. Is that correct? And so we're using government resources to prop up AI, to give resources to research this, and now those same, those same artificial intelligence things are scouring the internet to target certain types of speech. Would you agree with that? Uh, I, that's why we're here. That's what, what we're worried about. What, what kind of mechanisms do you think can be put in place to hold both government um, and private entities accountable for this type of behavior? Well, as I said, said in my opening statement, my biggest fear is that we uh, try to centralize it as a way of fixing it, and that actually fear of it being used as a censorship tool will prevent us from allowing other AI engines to, uh, to, to pop up and actually not have the same biases that are being baked in currently. Thank you for that. And, and I've just, I, I know I'm out of time, but I want to applaud you. Uh, you kicked over a hornet's nest, but we appreciate the work that you've done. Thank you. 
Gentlemen, yields back. I'm going to thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, we appreciate the, the, the testimony, the answering questions, and we appreciate, at least for three of you, the work you're doing in bringing this to light about what, what's happening with this censorship effort and the dangerousness, uh, the danger that exists, I should say, uh, with, with, uh, with AI. So with that, the, uh, the hearing is... It, you want a closing statement? Yeah. Okay. You get a closing statement, then maybe I'll yield to some, someone else to talk about. Go ahead. Sure, thank you. I, I knew you had offered it, so I jot some notes down just to quickly make a brief closing statement. First, you know, I do understand that free speech is very important, and we need, do need to protect it. I'm sworn as a barred attorney to protect freedom of speech and people's rights, and I think that's something that we should do. I am concerned, however, with the continuation of these kinds of hearings, that it does have a chilling effect, however, on individuals that are doing work to keep our country safe from cyber threats. Um, for the record, I'd like to introduce an article written in Politico, the far right is scaring away Washington's private hacker army. Scrutiny from conservative activists and management gripes are straining the government's plan to enlist elite security pros in the fight against malicious hackers. Thank you. That's a concern as well that we need to be careful of. And I also wanted to make a correction that that three days after the election, the individual that they asked to begin the process for taking down um, a tweet didn't mean that a tweet was going to be taken down. And that individual was not a political opponent three days after the election. He was just simply an anti-vaxxer, anti-Semitic posting, race-baiting, dog-whistling individual. I yield back. Uh, I just correct the record. It wasn't three days after the election. It was three days into the administration. So it was the government in power, the White House, saying, take down this tweet, ASAP. Um, that, to me, is significant. Whatever, you, whatever you, you think. And I would just say this. We are going to keep having hearings on the attack on the First Amendment because, as my colleague from Ohio pointed out just a few minutes ago, it is fundamental. We had a witness in our last hearing from Canada, journalist from Canada, and she talked about the, the underpinnings of Western civilization rest on the ability to speak, to debate, and not be afraid, not be intimidated by the government. And to the point from the ranking member, so they didn't take it down. Well, we all know there's this thing called the chilling effect when big government, particularly the White House, is saying to big tech, take down this tweet ASAP. I see you're nodding your head, Mr. Lukanov. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I, I want to do one last thing. I think you wanted to respond to Mr. Goldman a, a little while ago. Did, we'll give you a chance to do that, and then we'll close the hearing. But uh, did, I think you had a response to something Mr. Goldman said, uh, Congressman Goldman said earlier. If you don't remember, that's fine. We'll go on. But you can put your mic on there if you would. It was frustrating to hear people like, like me and Lee, who have done a great job defending people across the political spectrum over our career, be dismissed as people who only care about uh, the free speech rights of one side of the political fence. I mean, we, we've been, uh, fire has been second to no one when it comes to taking people on all across the political spectrum, and I have the hate mail to prove it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. That's why, as Mr. Bishop pointed out earlier, why as chair of this committee, I've invited more Democrats than I bet any Republican, maybe, who knows, maybe ever, I don't know, uh, but certainly in this Congress. We've had more people on the left, as you've described, or in the center, or people who were Democrats who say, I'm now independent because I can't take what they're doing. I just don't stand, for, uh, stand with them on their, their efforts to restrict the First Amendment. So again, I want to thank you all for being here, for, for speaking out. Without objection, the hearing is adjourned. <laughs>